like so. to open up a continuation on a request by the City of Northampton Office of Planning and Development for site plan for construction of a 40,000 square foot plus or minus office space and 20,000 square foot plus or minus boathouse and related, related site development for property on Damon Road, the Lane construction site, Northampton map ID 18-12. Um, before we jump in, Carolyn, you want to give us an update on the stormwater, which we didn't have at the last yes. uh, hearing. So that was the main, the stormwater issue was the main reason why you couldn't close the hearing the last, um, a month ago. DPW did issue a stormwater permit um, today. So you do have the ability to, to close the hearing and make a decision. Um, they also submitted comments today, some of which I think were follow-ups to some of the items um, that the applicant had addressed in the interim that had been raised in the first iteration that were not stormwater related. Um, and so I think I'm just pulling those up. Those came in this afternoon as well. Um, and um, there were sort of the, res the responses to the applicant's response to the original um, iteration of, of comments. So some of them they felt like were addressed, and then the others um, they um, I don't know that they, I mean, since Ty and Bond, some of the issues were related to traffic, and you heard from Ty and Bond, the consultant, about the traffic um, studies. So DPW didn't have the um, ability to, to see that presentation. So there's still some of the comments they felt like were still under, um, not addressed, although under the zoning, um, Planning Board is the jurisdiction to make a determination, and, uh, and the zoning actually specifically says that there's no traffic mitigation required for general industrial um, zone property. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just because DBW says they're not sure that they've been addressed doesn't mean you couldn't issue a permit or make a judgment call about the information that you heard last time. So. Um, that's about it. I can go into the specific DPW memo later after you hear from the applicant and okay. the things, the other items that they're going to address. Okay. Um, so, Wayne, you're going to pick up where you left off? Yeah, just very briefly because we presented it last time, so I'm not going to repeat any of that. Um, as Carol mentioned, we have the stormwater permit. The only comment I want to make about the DPW memo is this memo was issued uh, half an hour, an hour before the stormwater permit was, was issued. So in the memo, you see it says stormwater permit hasn't been issued, and they continue to have some comments about stormwater. I'm assuming because an hour or so later they issued the stormwater permit, once they finish review, that they've that those issues have, have been to their satisfaction. Okay. Um, so I can answer questions about sort of the big picture or traffic, but let me ask Jeff from Berkshire Design to address any of the more technical questions. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so as, as Wayne indicated, we did receive, uh, Carolyn indicated, we did receive the um, stormwater permit um, this afternoon, um, just after uh, the memo from uh, the memo was received. I can go through um, some of the items. A lot of them are items that will be addressed during um, completion of the construction documents. We're going to continue to work with the DPW and um, coordinate the Damon Road project. Um, some of the other utility issues are going to be coordinated all during the construction, the phasing. Um, and, you know, we've, we've agreed uh, to, you know, continue to correspond with them and, and make sure that all those things are aligned. Um, there are a couple of items in here that um, they explicitly said were not addressed. I, I can just go through those quickly. Everything else was either addressed or partially addressed. And the remainder, like I said, will be dealt with during the preparation of the construction documents um, as the project progresses. Um, some of the items that they said were not addressed. Um, one was um, the uh, site plan appearing to be a master plan. Um, and uh, phase construction plan should be integrated with the overall site plan. Um, their response was not addressed, but again, like I explained, it's we're going to continue to coordinate with them through the construction process as the, as the site is built out, so all those things will be addressed um, during the preparation of the, of the construction documents. Um, 
there was a comment about uh, utilities uh, not being shown from the river run condominiums. Those weren't explicitly picked up in our survey. Um, we will coordinate and um, pick up those utilities so that any new utilities that are proposed as part of this project going down the access road, um, there's you know ample space and ability to um, install all of those all of those items. Um, and I think the only other one that was listed is not addressed. Um, this is, this is again for um, the River Run condominium uh, utilities. Everything else, um, aside from traffic, was was addressed, um, or will continue to be uh, developed during during the preparation of the CDs. Okay. So I'm happy to go through any of the specific items if there's other questions. Maybe after discussion, Carolyn, you can go over the memo. Yeah. And hit the highlights, the technical stuff, and the stuff for kind of as built or when construction is done. Yeah. Maybe that's not so relevant, but the bigger issues. Okay. Uh, questions by the board. We heard the presentation last time, so nothing's really changed other than the stormwater issue. Uh, just a question about the lights. Um, did you guys talk? Uh, well, uh, for other uh, projects we've had that are down near Mass Audubon, um, we've had them on timers so that the lights in the parking areas would 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 not be on twenty you know from dusk sure. till dawn. Is it a, a possibility that the lights in that area could could go off at 10 or 11 so sure I don't I don't see any reason why they couldn't yeah yeah okay yeah um, and the only other question uh, do you have to do the full build out the full planting if they're only putting the pads in so the trees everything has to be planted for the plan even if they're only putting pads in for the buildings right now well <clears throat> as I understand they're not gonna put any pads in at all that the first this the build out might be a long time I think the, oh, the pads won't even go in for the first right so I think um, the part the access road and uh, particularly down to the you know whatever comes first we think um, I assume we think the docks are going to potentially come in first before anything else so there has to be um, the parking area for the dock and the area and the docks needs to be um, constructed but I think the landscaping and but but it also could be part of your condition of the permit that certain elements are in um, at certain phased points but landscaping given the location it's set way back you're not really going to see it from the road I think it would be appropriate that landscaping items um, go in at the time of individual building build out um, because then you, you obviously don't want to put everything in and then have to rip it up right. when you come for the next building. Mm -hmm. Just make one comment on the lighting. I mean, if, if you want all the lighting on a timer, we can certainly live with that. Our preference would be parking lot lighting, it's fine to be in a timer. Just the wall packs and the buildings themselves may want to stay on for security. Just mm -hmm. I think that's what we've done in the past is that the, the lights and the, the lots don't have to be on. Yeah, it's not right. We just did that at Atwood Drive. Yeah, we just did it at Atwood Drive and right. there are a couple other places where we, we've done yeah, that really we so. wall packs on it. Right. Mm -hmm. I think there's a gate there at 10 o'clock as opposed to just lights off. Mm. Okay, I guess, yeah, it's, I mean, is it, would the lights attract people to go hang out or would it, they discourage it's... I don't know that I know. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough site, lit or not lit, it's just, it's so far removed right. from everybody. Right. Okay. I, mean, I think if there are tents in the woods, it's sort of a separate issue from the lighting. Hey. Uh, Rick Kleinberg, Citizen Group. I think on behalf of the rowing community, we'd probably prefer to have the lights, they have the ability to have them on all night, just in case for security reasons for one. But another reason is that the, a lot of the rowers get there before dawn, and so they'd want some lights on when they get there and so on. So if we could have that option, and what we'd happily do is scale back to half lights, or some other, you know, one third lights are just to have enough on for security and let the rowers in pre dawn hours. Mm -hmm. okay. Lights won't be visible from the apartments. <coughs> I'm not sure. Could, yeah. could you see the lights 
for the sake of argument, if all the lights in the parking lot are on 24-7, can you, would you be able to see them from the apartment complex? I wouldn't anticipate that you could, no. Yeah. Okay. It's far enough away. Any other questions? Um, I was looking at the, the plat yeah, the area, and it looks like there's a couple of landlocked lots in there that this development could interfere with. And I'm assuming that they have a right of passage. I don't know whether that's been addressed or not. So there's two lots, one of which um, has a right from the access road, not to the lane side, so they wouldn't be affected. The other is minor. We haven't done a title search, but it's minor standing. The other lot has a right to cross the lane property, and they will continue to have that. Assuming they have a legal right, that lot right will continue. This won't change that. Anything else? So I was <clears throat> kind of fussy about traffic last time, and if that lot, if that empty lot got developed and had the right, then that would add one more business use to that private lane. And assuming they're above 2,000 square feet, they're going to be coming before you for their own project, right? Um, but, well, that, it's, it's used now. It's not going to add anything more. Okay. I mean, it could, but it isn't. Right. Be, because the, the riverfront area, that property, the footprint of the development area is about maxed out anyway. So it couldn't cover more land. But you're right, they could certainly go from a contractor's laydown yard to a building within the same footprint. Anybody else or open up for the public? Public. Okay, if anyone's here from uh, the public, uh, I'll, I'll call on you. And you can, if you could just come up to the podium, state your name uh, and address, and uh, we'll jump in. Yep. John Lyons. You can just put it in the holder. It'll, it'll pick you up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't start. Yeah. No, no, I won't. We have a tight um, agenda. Believe me, I won't. Uh, yeah, I'm John Lyons from uh, 80 Damon Road, which is River Run. Um, I had the dubious privilege a few years ago of uh, when I was a trustee of uh, serving a no trespassing order to, uh, what can I say, a river rat? No, that would be. incorrect politically but uh, I had told him that he was not welcome with his dog on the property and uh, anyhow that night somebody spotted him coming back and uh, I did have to serve a no trespassing order on him in the presence of a couple of policemen I'm 72 I was like 67 at the time but I had to run down in barefoot through the woods to find his tent with the with the offices anyhow the the thrust of my argument not my argument but my point here is if we do indeed have to endure more traffic there and it's already very congested trying to get in and out at certain times of the day sometimes it's fine um, I have noticed officers on the river I uh, river run side of Dunkin Donuts um, backed into a uh, side driveway waiting for speeders and that's good that's a good thing but um, when the, pe the when the perpetrators stop they seem to stop in front of the river run exit entrance I wonder if maybe the mayor or the chief of police could kind of advise these officers to uh, jump out as soon as they can after the speeder goes by, but wait maybe 20, maybe even 40 seconds before they turn on their lights and their sirens, because at that point, the um, alleged perpetrator could just 
pull into the mini mart, uh, which includes uh, the cat hospital and so forth, uh, on the right hand side, an easy stop, it would subject the officer to less danger from getting out of his car, and it would get him and the alleged perpetrator the hell out of the way of the traffic flow. And if there's nothing better than that that you can do when, when you're, uh, you know, doing all this uh, reconstructing, uh, that, you know, that might be a one or two or three percent advantage in favor of people trying to get out and get to work and so forth. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Jonathan Wright, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 91 Olander Drive. Um, I think the security question is something that all of us are concerned about, with young people at dusk and old people at dawn, or some combination. Um, and many rowing sites are at riverfront areas around the country. Uh, some are well lit, some are partially lit. Um, there is a universal experience there that the um, that many riverfront places in America because of polluted water have essentially been abandoned and have become gathering places for all kinds of elements, criminal and simply homeless folks who, who, who hang out there or live there. And that the, uh, the advent of, of uh, other citizens' activity, um, wholesome activities, <coughs> ath athletics, is a really positive outcome. Um, it's shown up in Middletown. It's shown up all up and down the Charles. It's shown up in uh, Nebraska, the University of Nebraska. Um, it's quite a remarkable thing that uh, uh, kids and young people and uh, old people and in-between people um, go there to do that. So I, I would say that, that the folks at River Run who might have a, a, uh, a very legitimate concern about uh, intrusion, actually this should help. Over time, I would hope that that gully between the two properties, which is actually the remains of the old Northampton New Haven Canal, could be cleaned up and uh, shown off as its uh, um, for its, its historic value. So I think in the end we'd have the same interests. I think uh, also uh, paddlers and rowers coming back and forth will want to adjust because no one likes to stand and wait in line to get out in traffic. I think there may be some plans afoot to improve Damon Road. And for all concerned, that would be, would be an advantage. Let me just say a few things. This is a unique site. I have looked at every waterfront piece of property, available and not available, between the uh, Holyoke Canoe Club and the Whateley Line on both sides of the river. This is unique. It is a man-made harbor dug out in 1857 uh, for the terminus of the canal. It is unique because um, it is it is all of those things. It is above the flood, uh, the 100-year flood line. The site is outside of the 200-year, the 200-foot uh, buffer. It is in Northampton, which means that the uh, youth rowers can get there in their carpools from school. And it's available. I started working on this particular site five and a half years ago, uh, when Lane and, and we got nowhere. When Lane called me three years ago, a little over, and said they were interested, I was just ecstatic. The rowing programs that have helped youth and, uh, and us older folks over the last uh, 10, 11, 12 years here have really have a, it's a story to tell, and I don't want you to bore you with the whole story, but it's been a transformative thing for the high school and for adults. I will simply so, tell you that in my own experience, uh, acquiring this skill late in life actually saved my life. So I'm here to tell you about that, and I can do the same for others. The program opportunities that can expand uh, in the morning and the afternoon for special needs kids during the day. There's all kinds of uh, ways to reach um, less well-served portions of our population if there is broader access, a longer season, and a safe access to the site. Right now, <coughs> the rowing programs at the Oxbow, which are wonderfully hosted by the marina, when the water is high, you cannot reach the boathouse. So if there is a medical emergency at the boathouse, they will take a pontoon boat over to the marina. And it's 20 to 25 minutes to cool the day. That is not a safe condition. 
In this condition, we've made arrangements and talked at length with the fire department about locating their rescue boat at this location, which will give them about an eight-minute response to the Coolidge Bridge instead of 52 minutes now from the firehouse down to the Oxbow and back up. There's a lot to commend this from a number of perspectives, so I really urge you to take that broad perspective. Um, and uh, as far as lighting, I, do, I think we have a dark skies requirement. Um, and having been through that a number of times with you, but also in the, the work that we do in town, it's quite remarkable that actually dark skies lighting and, and um, works. Wall packs are a problem because they, they glare out, but you can light and secure a site with close to zero spillage. So I think from a neighborhood standpoint, the project would be for good neighbors. I think it's also, and I'm sorry to take so much time, um, <clears throat> it calls for a 20,000 square foot house, you know, uh, in, in our dreams um, that would you know we should be so lucky were there uh, a partner to produce such a facility that would be great but in the short term and in the foreseeable future unless something changes radically we'll be very hard pressed to raise the funds for something simply to keep the boats dry out of the sun so we'll be working hard to do that with with your support and uh, appreciate it very much thank you yep in the back Santos. I live at River Run, 80 Damon Road, apartment 5102. So I'm really excited about the Boathouse project. I think it's a wonderful idea to have that area developed. Um, and I know that Northampton was just voted um, one of the most pedestrian-friendly cities. It had that honor. I just wanted to remind the city that there are 500 plus people living at River Run. And um, I've lived there 10 years, and I've heard talk over that time about um, sort of linking us to the city in ter with walkways or being able to cross that road or having a sidewalk. So I'm hoping that through this time, that could be something that's really looked at and developed as well. My, my fear is that we're getting, we're gonna be boxed in. If, if we could see movement towards having a walkway, being able to cross the street. Um, as, I, I've, as I've told Wayne, we had a great info meeting and he was there, we thank him very much. Um, I see old people walking on the street to go to CVS to get their prescriptions. I see young moms, and I see kids with young moms with their kids just walking on the street. So um, I would love to see a balance. Like I, I think, the, like I said, the project is great, but we need a way to be able to get out of there safely with walking or with bicycles. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. Evening, Tim O'Donnell, River Run. Uh, I was here last month, so I won't reiterate uh, the many concerns that I expressed. I just want to reemphasize the uh, desire for the city planners to consider some considerations for River Run uh, due to the uh, anticipated increased use of our recently uh, restored private driveway. And I do want to emphasize that because I know the pictures say lane uh, road or uh, access road to lane. I just want to remind folks that's our private driveway. Yes, they do have a legal uh, easement on it, but if in all these planning uh, discussions, some consideration could be made for us. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? on behalf of Northampton Community Rowing. I'm the president of the association. I'd like to thank you and to thank Jonathan for all the hard work on putting in this site. As I mentioned before, rowing is an increasingly popular activity here in Northampton and right now we have over 92 eighth to twelfth graders participating and depending on time of year, two to three dozen adults. That doesn't include the Yankee rowing and the kayakers and paddlers that would use this site. This site would be a definite benefit to Northampton and add to the attraction of being a pedestrian friendly and a river friendly site. And the legitimate concerns of River Run, I do hope you address because that will also impact the ability for the rowers to get to the site. But I do thank you for doing this and please give it your serious consideration. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. 
Hi, I'm uh, Jose Peyron, and I'm also a resident at River Run. Um, like Tim was saying, one of my biggest concerns there is um, I work here in Northampton, and when I get out in the morning, sometimes it's okay, you can get out, nothing's blocked. Sometimes I come home, and then it's a bottleneck all the way down Damon Road. Uh, I mean, it's tough to get in, it's tough to get out. I can't even fathom once you get the rowing uh, team in there and you get the parents coming down to see the you know, the, the competitions and all that, how bad it's going to get. I mean, the road is very small. It is a private driveway. It's not really designed to be a road. We just finished paving it not too long ago. River Run actually paid for that. Um, so, I mean, we definitely need to make that a priority, how that's going to work out. I mean, there's only one entrance to River Run. We have 500 plus people living there. That's a lot of people that live in one spot and have to come in and out the same way. God forbid something happen and we get that access uh, road blocked by an accident or whatever, we're stuck. We can't get out. I mean, there, there's only one exit and one entrance. Uh, so we definitely need to make that a priority. We can't just kind of sweep it under the rug. Or I mean, it's, it's a great thing that we're having a rowing uh, team come there and, and participate. And, and, and I think it's a great development, better than what they had there before, which was nothing. Safety concerns should also be addressed. Um, I like the fact that there's going to be lighting proposed, you know, uh, 24 hours a day. That's very important because right now, uh, I mean, I worked for the prosecutor's office for 13 years and we did have crime there. We did have a lot of vagrants that came and set up tents in the back by the river. Um, it's still happening. What it's, what's going to happen once they start developing, I don't know if it's going to push them away or attract more people. But what's happening is, is that they eventually will stroll over the river cars that are open that they can break into or whatever so maybe some uh go over the police logs and stuff to see if there's you know how many incidents have been there do some kind of a, of a research on, on on the crime rate you know that whole area and how it's all going to change and the possibilities and all that um it, it's, it's a big concern for us i mean uh we've already had a, a big, uh, big drop in the uh in the real estate and so we don't want to take another drop because we're putting something back there that's going to affect us in a negative way uh, but i think it's it's a great development and and i'm all for it but we definitely need to address the, the road the access how we get in how we get out um i know there's going to be a light put over at a uh industrial lane that's going to affect us as well that bottleneck will increase now because there's going to be a light there um, so all that's going to affect us in a, in a really bad negative way, and we just need to address it. We need to figure out how we can do it so that everyone's happy, everyone gets what they want, and, uh, you know, and, and that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Questions from the board? Yeah, I had a question. Um, the question for the uh, the crew: Are they going to actually run races from that location? It would uh, take some time, but at the most, you would have one in the fall and one in the spring. Yeah. But, uh, it, yeah, it is potential once we get a boathouse from the side up, but it's no more than two. So there's a place you could put a course right in there. Oh, yes. They're okay. Just north of there. There's a great place for. We're going to put wide access easement. 30 foot wide easement. But what's the paved way? From this line to this line. Uh, Jeff, if we can ask, do you know what the, there's a 30 foot wide easement on the road. What's the actual width of the paved area that currently exists? Is it 30 feet or is it? It varies. It varies from, you know, 20 feet up to, well, I think 26. Um, it's, it's not a consistent width all the way down. Okay. I suspect it's 20 or less the length. So where are we with sidewalk? What do you mean? Yeah, are they planning a sidewalk in there? Are they planning a sidewalk um, along the... Only if they get permission. Yeah. All right, so, th that's, so we're showing sidewalks. We're offering to do them, but the right-of-way doesn't... We don't think it gives us the right to do it. So if River Run would grant the right, that would be part of what we're doing. Uh, do we ask the 
river run do they i mean uh, who are you working with Wayne, to make that decision who's whose decision who has the final decision i you know i don't know their bylaws it, um i met with the trustees twice in the neighborhood uh, once um and i don't know some condos it requires a super majority vote of the membership oh so i don't okay. know the i mean i know the trustees and basically made the offer right. on, and the next step do the plan show it does that mean we have to put a condition in or is the, because it's on the plans? Well, I think what you could do is put a condition that um, they that there's a good faith effort for the applicant to to proceed on construction of that easement and show that it has either that it has failed because show the prove the vote right. of the trustees um, indicating that they don't want it or um, showing that they do want it and then um, if it is approved, you could put a time certain by which it needs to be constructed. And that's the same thing with the, the condition that's in there for before the, per, the uh, construction of the second pad that they'll have the left lane turn added to the end right. of the road. Right. So it's similar to that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, I mean, back to the lighting issue. I mean, I'm not sure. It sounds like we've heard both sides of it. I, I mean, I brought it up. I'm willing to allow the applicant and the, the residents to decide for that particular location. <laughs> Having, for security reasons, because it is so remote, leaving the lights on, uh, it's fine with me. Um, so I'm not sure if other people feel. I don't have an issue with it from a security sense. I don't know if you need you know, the level of lighting that is required or the amount of lighting that's required or if we're prohibited from keeping the lighting on, you know, because of the night sky issue. No, you're not prohibited. I think it's just an issue of, you know, energy conservation versus and whether it makes sense. And I think, you know, given the um, feedback, you might consider either um, requiring it to be um, dimmed or something at mm -hmm. a certain time or just not addressing it not requiring it at all I mean given that we do have the dark sky though the, there's cutoffs and the light levels are low as it is lower than what um, previous commercial developments have been built about. Right. so it's really up to the board to determine whether they think there should be any adjustment to that or any restriction well, I like not having the Offer made by the applicant. Because they're the ones that yeah. either go up or have the most spill. Mm -hmm. And and I think they would have every incentive to light the parking lot less if they felt it really was needed. Right. So I I'm I think it will be self-correcting is what I bet. Right. No need to make a, a condition. Well, I think what Wayne was saying though is they were going to leave the lot the, the the building lights the wall packs the wall packs on and I think Devin you're saying you would like those turned off. Those are the ones that I think are. I mean, if you're lighting the parking lot, why would you need those building lights on? I think at, I think at entry at the entryway the wall, the lights need to be on, but I don't know about you know. Yeah. Um, the circumference of the building. I guess I was just under the assumption that building wasn't being used at night, but I guess it could be. So well, it's not so much at night. I think. Lurking in the doorway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I mean, be the early morning. I think. Typically, here from police is they're not going to live there. They're going to do a quick drive by. If they drive by, they like to see if someone's lurking by the building. The parking lot's less of an issue. I mean, obviously, the parking lot's an issue if there's people there, but. Yeah, I mean, given the remoteness of the location, it's the, it's the I, I don't feel as strongly about it as I've done in other places uh, because of this or about when we did it before we got the tent, right. uh, or it's down on King Street, you know, where we're trying to do something about the, the overflow of the lights. So, you know, the remoteness of this. I can't read the photometrics, unfortunately, because the, the numbers are too small. I'm assuming everything's below a five. Oh, yeah. 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 And they are LED. They are LED fixtures, so you know, cutting the intensity in half is achievable. Are they twenty-foot poles? Um, yeah.
Yeah, I mean, it's. I feel that strongly about it, you know. But. So the, I guess the options are, you know, no wall packs and, and the, the lights in the, in the parking lot or the other way around. We're both on, but we dim the parking lots or we just allow the applicant to, to self-regulate based on what they see as their needs. Seems, seems to me that if, if they comply with the uh, light or, lighting ordinance, that they should be fine. Mm. I mean, in the past, maybe it, to be consistent, we've had wall packs on and sight lighting off. In this case, maybe wall packs on, sight lighting reduced. Well, I think so at the place would be like Cole Morgan, which is in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Um, this doesn't have that problem. Well, it is, it's next to a fairly large residential neighborhood. Oh, no, but, it, but I think but, but what they're saying is they can't see them from River Run. I think that was that. How can that be true? Well, that was the, the, the response to the question is you won't be able to see these lights from River Run. So that's, I, I guess that's why I wasn't worried about that. So. I mean, unless you, uh, there's a particular thought you guys have for how you want to do this. Um, I mean, I, Obviously, we like as much flexibility as possible because you're right. We just we don't know the issues. I mean, to the extent that we have a homeless population staying there, we'd probably leave lights on. My assumption is the more active the use of the site is, the less that's the problem. But I think we'd like to be able to respond to changing conditions. After all, there are no lights there now at all, right? Right. right. That's. I mean, I'd be inclined to say have wall packs on at a minimum for security, building security, and then leave it up to the to them to figure out if they need or want the poles, the poles, and how many or to what degree. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so public comment still open. We'll move to close public comment. Second. Second. Stephen, second. All in favor. So the I haven't as uh, was the case last time. I haven't heard anything negative about the actual project as far as what it is, what it what it means uh, to the community, the function, and so forth. It's been security and traffic. Um, so I don't have I don't have an issue with the building, the, the, the layout, and, you know, the lighting we discussed. Um, I think we just need to get a handle on traffic and safety. Safety, one of the biggest things which we talked about well before this project, um, foot traffic, pedestrian traffic from River Run, which if we can tie in with sidewalks and make a good faith effort and so forth, that would at least be movement in the, in the right direction. Um, and then the traffic, you know, it's a tough issue that, that coming out, coming in and out at Damon Road is, is going to be difficult. It is difficult. But I don't think that should preclude us from developing what seems to be a, a good project. Do we have some conditions? Um, yes. So um, as, as you all know, site plan approval is about the way the site functions. It's not whether or not the use should be allowed there. So you're looking at the technical standards. And um, uh, based on comment and then sort of issues that have come up in the public hearing and review. Um, one, the multi-use path shall be constructed concurrent with the development of the first office or commercial building construction. Um, prior to the issuance of the building permit for the second commercial building or construction that results in 20,000 square feet of space, the left turn lane shall be added to the driveway intersection at Damon Road as recommended in the traffic analysis. Um, covered sheltered bike storage areas shall be provided in front of each building for storage of at least six bicycles. Alternatively, end users may incorporate storage inside the building if it's shown to accommodate six bicycles at the time of building permit application. Um, bicycle loop shall be provided in front of the boathouse for up to ten bicycles. 
prior to division of property interest, shared maintenance and access agreement shall be recorded at the Registry of Deeds for the Boathouse and the commercial buildings. Language shall be submitted to the Office of Planning and Development for approval prior to recording. And then one that we just discussed, the sidewalk to Damon Road shall be constructed concurrent with the build out of the first phase of the project, either the boathouse or, you know, whichever comes first. Um, unless proof is shown that the River Run Condominium Association has voted to prohibit its construction. That maintenance agreement covers the issues of snow removal and... Right, on that site. Right. right. Um, and the issue of maintenance of the actual easement access is that's not what um, I certainly intended by this because there's already a written easement for the property. And I think it makes sense for if River Run feels like they're not, it, maybe they need to go and investigate what the easement language is and go back to the property owners and say, well, as part of the easement, you owe X. But that's a separate document. It's already on record. You ready for a motion? I'm ready. You guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. I move that we grant the request by the City of Northampton Office of Planning and Development for site plan for construction of 40,000 plus or minus square feet of office space and 20,000 plus or minus square feet boathouse and related site development for property on Damon Road Lane Construction Site, Northampton, map ID 18 12. So conditions? With the conditions. With, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> With the conditions that here, Carolyn just read. Excuse me, second. All in favor? Okay. What's up? Thank you. Three minutes, I know. I know. <laughs> We're at the same time. No, just two. <laughs> yeah. What, you don't like me anymore? I know, I feel like that. <laughs> Thanks. You can move down here, that way you'll be in the camera. Oh, that's okay. Stay here. <laughs> The first one, I really like it. Okay. This is a revised layout. The first one is there. Okay. Whoever hey, who's that guy who sits in the second one? I actually had to get a building permit. Really? All right. So are we do an office service this first? Before. Go. Yes, we should. I'm moving back. Is this the document that was referred to in the application that doesn't want the application? I don't know if that's the one or not. Virtual. Yeah, Virtual. Yeah, that's the one Virtual. Oh, actually, this is for the second yeah, one. Okay. Sorry. This is Austin yeah, Circle, yeah. not Virtual. Sorry. He's old. Come on, Mark. Tick, 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 tick. All right, well, I'm looking for my things. It is we're five minutes behind. Uh, I'm going to open up a request by Northeast Solar Design for a special permit for ground mounted solar panels at 38 Birch Hill Road, Florence Map ID 29 559. Yeah, how much of a presentation? I didn't bring enough documents for everyone, but if you need to see the site plans, et cetera, of the array. No, it's in the application. It's in the application. Yeah, this is a simple ground mount array at uh, 38 Birch Hill. Could you just state your name? Sorry. My name is Gregory Garrison. I'm the general manager of Northeast Solar. It's a 6.2 kilowatt array uh, mounted uh, to the north side of the house uh, facing southern. Dimensions approximately 33 feet long, 14 or 11 and a half feet wide. Um, no really visible connection between that and the adjoining properties as far as a visual standpoint. We did post a sign, which I brought back with me for 14 days in front of the front. So it's fairly straightforward. Just the, the reason we're doing this is because... Okay. So the, yeah. the way the zoning, <laughs> the way the zoning was adopted yeah. was um, that there are certain um, solar arrays that are allowed by right in the zoning. 
Um, and those are anything mounted on the roof, and I'm talking about residential districts for the moment, anything mounted on the roof or over a yard area that might be the parking uh, driveway or garage or um, any kind of parking facility. Um, but then, um, and then, I'm sorry, and over a driveway, it's site plan approval, but then um, off the driveway in the yard, um, it, the planning board ha requires a special permit. There's a special permit required by the planning board. Sorry, um, and I th the issue at the time was, you know, I think one of not knowing how big are these systems going to be, and it allows up to 200 percent of um, energy generated for the ex the, the associated site. So if a, if and, it, and it, this is about accessory uses, not just the function of generating power in and of itself. Um, so, you know, you've seen one of these already um, up on Chesterfield Road. That was a bigger system and generating more than <coughs> the needs for the um, use at hand. But nevertheless, um, there isn't really an intermediate step um, in the zoning allowing for something that's pretty much just for the need of the um, homeowner as opposed to needs of the homeowner plus. Um, it goes up to 200 percent is the allowance in a residential district. So two issues. One is there are quite a bit, there's more setbacks than standard detached accessory structures for solar mounted arrays and I think you'll probably hear more um, comment about that at another date when you don't have a bunch of public hearings. But at any rate, that's where the zoning sits at this point. But didn't we in the new zoning, the proposed zoning changes for U R A B and C, we changed it. Yeah, there so it's on the table, but it hasn't really right. moved anywhere. So right. you guys have had conversation about maybe reevaluating that and also looking at the setbacks because in A, B, and C it also requires currently fifty feet of setback and most of the lots in A, B, and C right. don't even have fifty feet to begin with. So. I was gonna ask you about the fifty foot setback seems unreal for people who live on a hundred foot lot. Right. 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 <laughs> but I think if if you know, somebody can put their solar array over the driveway by right and our fear was we have these giant ground mounted solar arrays in somebody's yard that aesthetically wouldn't be appropriate but if it's if it's a, up to a hundred percent and it's specifically just for the house that might be a, a, you know something we look at to allow by right and so that an application <clears throat> such as this doesn't have to go through this whole process when we have uh, we have an additional eight of these after this first hearing, everything will do them in one night. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, so it might be something to think about. <laughs> For your saying, too. Right, exactly. <laughs> Along that line, I was not really impressed with the applications. Okay. There was no locus on the front uh, oh. showing its location in relation to surrounding properties or oh, right. cities. We, um, yeah, we've subsequently, we have through the GIS mapping. And, yeah, and then this thing is. Oh, you have, is this different than? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just a plot plan it's showing the outlines and exactly where it sits on the lot. Right. There, I, I think a smaller version of that was included in the staff recommendation. All right. Yeah. It doesn't show that. So I'd like a little more visual detail. Um, some of these okay. Would you like the the outline of the plot and the setbacks yep. in within that? Okay. Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. More information than we need is fine. I totally understand. <laughs> Uh, any other questions for the board? No. Is anyone here from the public that wishes to speak about this? Yeah, Lou. I'm Louis Hasbrook. I'm on the Northampton Energy Sustainability Commission, and I'm speaking, I speak in favor of this project and uh, one installment. So, from our perspective, can, uh, solar arrays that supply power for a, for a single dwelling are uh, like the goal of the Thank you. Thanks, Anybody else? No? Move to the public hearing. Second. Second by Stephen. All in favor? Any discussion? Seems pretty straightforward. I move we approve a request by Ronald Bryce for special permit for ground mounted solar panels at 88 8 Austin Circle. Oh, Florence. this is a uh, wrong one. One before it. Back up. Oh. Sorry. 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 I move we uh, approve a request by Northeast Solar Design for special permit for ground mounted solar panels at 38 Birch Road, Florence Map ID 29559. 
Arch Hill Road. That's all right. I went to Birch Lane by mistake. I got a second. Second. <laughs> These two are squabbling. You can't sit next to each other. Anymore. I know. Is that a second? That was a second. That was a second. All in favor? Thank you. All right. Thank you. They both say 740. Yeah, so. I know. So we're behind, even though that only took four minutes for behind. No, he's still well, we talking. We can get rid. We can catch up. Yep. Okay, next up, scheduled for, hearing scheduled for 740, request by Ron Priest for a special permit for ground-mounted solar panels at 88 Austin Circle, Florence map ID 29-345. How you doing? Hi. I'll take the approval already. <laughs> uh, it's just a basic, it's 100%. Get your name. Ronald Greasy. Yep. 88 Austin Circle. <laughs> Uh, it's 100% uh, payback on the house, no extra. It's going to be behind the garage. It won't be seen from the road. It's going to be on the ground. The, the garage is going to be a little higher, a lot higher than because it sets down in the ravine. And I had we were passed out as what I gave you the structures. What's going to be out there? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the way back of the land. It's going to be set up. It's 50 feet, and then it sets back in on both sides. It takes up the the rear quarter, the rear back of the yard. That's not being used for anything but you know, just grass. Mm -hmm. There's a tree belt right behind that. Is are you going to have to remove any trees right where that's going, or no? No, sir. Okay. It's not going to be. Uh, uh, there's concrete pads on the ground now. Are those for the solar array? No, I was gonna. I was in the process of uh, looking at uh, a different system. I had to see what they look like. Uh, this, these will probably they will be incorporated if I can use them. Yes. Uh, they they look like they're going to be used. Uh, they were made to to go in there, but then um, I wasn't too sure as to what I could do. So I, I didn't do anything else until I, I didn't realize I needed to get some, one more step. But those, they were going to go in, and then I said, well, I got to, once I found out I needed one more step to go into this, I had to wait and see. If I can use them, I will, yes. Okay, there's also a stream back there. He had to get approval from the Conservation Commission. Okay, there, there, there is a wet. There is approval for the okay. conservation. Yep, he already went through that process, and then. And if you look up over, that's the back of Ryan Road School. Yes, sir. Okay, then if you would put in a locus map, I know that. That's why I sent you. So, but comments about the quality of the application still apply. On this. I. I'd like better drawings and, and more detail. I'm sorry. Better drawings and more detail. Is, did you on the back? Is the back page? Um, yeah. It's okay. It doesn't show the stream. Well, the stream runs in parallel. Yeah, well, this is better, but you just yeah. gave it to us. Yeah. Parallel, so, yeah. Okay. That's all. Okay. Any other questions? No. Anyone from the public like to speak about this one? No. I'll move a closed public hearing. Second. Second, Stephen. All in favor? Try again. <laughs> uh, discussion? Now, so, so, well, I guess the only question, so if the zoning that we just discussed passes, these will no longer be special permit unless it's above 200% of the required use of the, 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 the dwelling? 100%. Well, 100%. Um, the zoning that's under consideration now are for A, B, and C. This, these two were in water supply protection, so we'd have to go back and okay. specifically address water supply protection and then SR and RR. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you'd be halfway through. But you are A, B, and C. As long as it's under 100% of the, the use of the, the dwelling, it's going to be by site plan or by right? 
Um, I'd have to pull that. I don't up. worry about. It. I just because yeah. I, I, I remember we talked. I don't about remember it. the exact language, right. but we can um, n we can go it's over it. Come back to us anyway. Yeah. 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 Or the, I mean, the question would be if it met all the setbacks, it would maybe be by right. But then the question is, are the setbacks reasonable? Right. And then we had a discussion about percentage of cover. Like, could they cover their entire right right lawn? Right. Uh, so I that's think what that was the worry. Right. Okay. The solar panels count as open space. <laughs> Any other discussion? No? Who wants to make a motion on this one? I'll fix yep. it this time, yes. <clears throat> I move we approve a request by Ronald Rice for a special permit for ground mounted solar arrays at 88 Austin Circle, Florence, map ID 29 345. Second. Stephen, second. All in favor? Thank you. We've got four minutes to kill this. Eight o'clock. Uh, okay, moving along. I'd like to open up the request for site plan approval uh, by the Danton Group to construct an 83 room, 58,000 square foot assisted living facility on Village Hill Road, Northampton Map ID 38A 110. And we've got a presentation. Good evening, everybody. My name is Walter Ohanian. I'm the managing director of the sponsor of the Grantham Group. And what we're proposing is an 83 unit, three story assisted living community, which 52% of the units are considered affordable. And what that means is residents who earn less than 60% of the area median income are actually eligible to, to live there. So that's a total of 43 out of the 83 units will be considered low income. Out of those 43 low income units, 17 of them will actually be for residents who are 30% or less the area median income. The services offered at an assisted living, at this assisted living, will be assistance with personal care that includes bathing, dressing, grooming, three meals a day for the residents, on-site 24-hour staff, medication reminders. We have one standard of care that we give all of our residents, whether they fall into the low-income program or whether they are considered a market rate assisted living resident. We also offer daily activities to the residents. That will be seven days a week. Weekly laundry and housekeeping services. They're all going to have their own apartments that will have an emergency call system and also night safety checks for the residents as well. We have a nurse on staff and a social worker on staff for the residents as well. We're trying to create an efficient design here by using this building. Out of the building, there will be roughly 12 one bedrooms, and the remaining 71 units will be, be between studios and studio of alcove units. The average size of a studio or studio alcove unit will be about 330 square feet, and the average size of a one bedroom is about 525 square feet. We have 24 hour site staff on board, and we use a universal worker concept. We, our staff are called companions. And these companions follow everything that the resident does, whether it's help with medication reminders, whether it's help with getting dressed in the morning, or whether it's doing the activities of the day. So they have a true companion that they have that helps them every step of the way. We also have proposed two country-style dining rooms for the building as well. And the nice concept about that is when residents move into the community, they don't go into a main dining room. What they actually do is they go into a country style type of dining room and they're eating with the people who live on their floor, which is nice. It gives a much more friendly concept for them. The project's gonna generate approximately $8.6 million in construction spending and result in about 65 related jobs. Should take about a year or so to build. Additionally, facility is gonna make estimated annual purchases of goods and services from local vendors of about $155,000 within this local community. In the areas of snow removal, program entertainment, transportation, advertising, and administrative expenses. At this point, I'd like to turn over to Dave LaPointe at Beals and Thomas. My name is Dave LaPointe from Beals and Thomas. We're the civil engineers and landscape architects for this project. Um, the site is located within the Village Hill development, and it's essentially located in this 
area right here with Musanti Drive to the west, Moser Street to the north, and this is Village Hill Road uh, to the east. Route 66, Prince Street is down in this area down here, uh, and then this is Olander Drive. This building here is the Haskell Building or the uh, Department of Mental Health is located here with their parking at the rear of the, the building. And this is an existing uh, building that was formerly part of the Northampton State Hospital. This is known as the Male Attendance Building. Uh, so again, here's the Male Attendance Building. This is Village Hill Road, Moser Street, and Musanti Drive. And this is the proposed building cited here with access coming in off of Village Hill Road in this area, which would act as more of a drop-off pickup area with the parking lot uh, located towards the rear of the building with access off of Musanti Drive. Uh, the intent here is that there's uh, a, not a lot of uh, traffic throughout the day. The parking lot would generally be utilized by employees who come in for a, a work shift as well as an occasional visitor it's typically nights and weekends. Um, there is a total of uh, 29 parking spaces. 27 of them are located at the rear of the building here, and two handicapped spaces at the front main entrance uh, to the building off of Village Hill Road. Uh, anyone parking in the rear parking lot in this area would simply uh, park their vehicle and then walk their way around the building, uh, utilizing a new sidewalk as well as the existing bike path that's located. Uh, to the rear of the male tenants building and uh, adjacent to the parking lot for the uh, Haskell building. Uh, this slide just gives a little bit of the details of the site. Um, as mentioned, the uh, building's a three-story building. Uh, that's actually three stories above ground. There is a basement level, which will include the kitchen, which will prepare all the meals for the residents, as well as uh, utility uh, uh, rooms down there for the heating and cooling and so forth. Um, the total site is approximately two and a half acres. Uh, currently, it consists of two, uh, two uh, existing lots, uh, but those two lots actually encompass the male attendance building as well as then some of that available vacant land. In this area, we're proposing to reconfigure those lots to still have two lots, but basically to have the male attendance building on its own lot with this development on a separate lot. Uh, in the Village Hill, <coughs> planned village district, I should say, uh, there's minimal setback requirements. Um, and we've basically utilized the, those requirements or the, 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 the minimal setback requirements to place the building up close to the sidewalk to present sort of a, a, a more interesting streetscape. Uh, but it's, still, it's consistent with some of the uh, residential buildings that were developed over the years across the street on Moses Street up in this area. Those were developed by uh, the community builders. <coughs> um, this is the floor plan of the first floor of the building. Uh, the architect is here as well. We can go over some of the details of that. But it's generally to show you. This is the main entrance here. Uh, some of the units spread throughout the building as well as a lot of the activity rooms, whether it be the a multi-purpose room. Um, a uh, pub room, so to speak, where they might have some of their um, activities or functions in some of those rooms, as well as obviously some of the uh, administrative and nurse, nursing stations and so forth. They're located there. Um, actually, I guess I can jump back for a second here. Um, the, uh, just in terms of overall uh, engineering design, the uh, western parking lot here, the drainage, um, as you may know that this overall Village Hill development has been master planned uh, and over the past few years there's been stormwater management infrastructure that's been constructed. So this system, uh, that's the drainage that's being collected for this parking lot here is actually being uh, connected to a stub that was left when Musanti Drive was uh, improved which then will drain to Basin 3 what's called Basin 3 over in this area on the western side of the site. Uh, in this area, as far as the entry drive, there was another stub that was left uh, for connection, anticipating development of this lot that connects to Village Hill Road drainage infrastructure, which ultimately leads on to uh, the Basin 4 uh, 
stormwater system, which is on the far east side of the overall village hill development. Uh, other utilities have already been incorporated into this development. As I said, it was master planned, and stubs were left behind for future development of these sites. So there's water connections already there, electrical, uh, gas connections that are all there that we're basically just plugging into. Um, we did receive some comments from uh, the planning department and we responded to those comments. We provided a supplemental letter with some answers to those items and some uh, additional drawings. Uh, we anticipate incorporating those uh, into a final set of plans once we um, uh, can get, we actually have additional comments from the DPW as well that we just received today. We anticipate incorporating those into a final set of drawings as well prior to getting a uh, building permit. Um, can you talk about when you're on that site plan, one of the issues was um, bike storage? Where, sure. Where, can you just show uh, where that's incorporated? Yeah, we would, we would basically anticipate putting some uh, bicycle racks probably in this rear area here. Um, like I said, that's where visitors primarily as well as um, uh, the employees would be parking. So essentially they, they could be uh, leaving their bikes in a bike rack. This is kind of a, a uh, plaza area, so to speak, in this area here, so we could utilize some of that space for some bicycle parking with some bike racks. Uh, one of the comments that uh, we had received was regarding some of the lighting as well. We um, revised some of the lighting so that we were in, in compliance with the uh, zoning ordinance. Um, so it's a full cutoff fixture, and we're trying to basically we're, we're Need, we needed to comply with the no more than five foot candle, so we had to make some adjustments there um, to make that work. Uh, but that's all uh, incorporated at this point now. So, I think we're at that, so. Um, let's see. So, and then these are some images of the this image on the top here. That's an elevation of the proposed building. These images here are an existing facility that the Grantham Group. Uh, runs in Marlboro, Mass, uh, but it's very similar architecture, materials, and so forth. But again, um, Clay Smook, the architect, is here as well, who could answer some questions on any of that. Um, but uh, we're hoping that tonight we can uh, get an approval. Any outstanding items could be incorporated as a condition, um, and then, like I said, revise, pr provide revised plans in order to um, address all the comments prior to getting a building permit. Uh, comments from the DPW um, for those? Yeah, I mean, I should probably um, read through those. A lot of them are technical, and they're just, um, just um, they talk about um, plan set, plan details that need to be modified just to be consistent with other plans that the DPW has already approved, given that this is a master plan project. We've got as built for some sections, and so they were just um, mostly about that. There were a couple of um, which I think could easily just be incorporated as conditions. I can run through them. There are probably 10 or 15 that are really sort of minor plan detail changes, nothing major. Yeah, if they're all technical. Um, and then the other, um, um, the other issue which is already in a proposed condition is that um, they need to just um, close the loop on the stormwater. There's, there's an overall stormwater permit granted for the site. And this, um, there's some revised calculations that just need to be incorporated into the original stormwater permit, and that should be done prior to building permit. But um, I think that was already noted in the staff memo to you all. Um, and then DPW also suggested um, modifying some locations of the proposed two proposed red oak trees just to be at the um, outside the drip line of Im impact with some of the infrastructure. So I think those again. Are minor. Um, other than that, there aren't really any. And then just notification that a um, stormwater pollution prevention plan is going to be required. A um, notice of intent with EPA for construction, but I think that's pretty standard. Yeah. Fair. Over an acre or so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Um, and then, so th that was that. And then the other issue I discussed with Doug McDonald this afternoon um, was related really to the design guidelines. Um, for Village Hill related to infiltration and there's a an, an, um, recommendation or encouragement that wherever possible where soils can take it that 
roof runoff should be infiltrated on site instead of sending it to the detention ponds. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I sent that comment to you earlier today, I don't know if you have any response to that, if that's feasible instead of sending them to the ponds, if you can just infiltrate in that green space. Well, the interesting thing about that is, is uh, when we did go to the technical review committee meeting, we had intended, or we, we did show that we are considering a infiltration basin on the site. However, when we dove deeper into the uh, uh, basin information or drainage information that's already been constructed out there, we realized that basin three, which is to the, um, well, it's to the west, actually, I'll show you on that. Yeah, so it's right, actually. Basin three is actually this right here. Basin three is actually an infiltration basin. Um, so our runoff, as I mentioned, is getting collected from this parking area as well as the roof runoff and being piped over to Basin 3, and it is actually being infiltrated uh, once it reaches Basin 3. And that's about 75 or even greater percent of the entire site, right? Yes. It's going over to that site. Right. Okay. There is some interest by the applicant as well to do some um, possible rainwater harvesting, uh, for irrigation and whatnot that um, could potentially reduce some of the runoff that's heading towards either of the basins. Um, that's something that is being considered as well, but hasn't been. Hasn't is there been any? Um, is there any action on um, trying to go for lead certification, or um, have you thought about that? Because one of those might be. I mean, that might help in your certification process. Good evening. I'm Paul Shaw. Capital advisors were consultants to grant the project their lead process as well. And the answer is um, yes, we've already conducted a preliminary assess lead assessment for the project. <coughs> and at the moment, we're, um, we're feeling pretty comfortable that lead certified uh, is very achievable for the project. Um, and in the course of doing that, we're going to take advantage of, uh, of probably take advantage of the point for, uh, for rain rainwater harvesting as well as the, uh, for the bicycle racks and, and showers, we're going to use that as, uh, as well. So we'll, we'll be addressing a lot of those issues through our uh, attempt to get to LEED certified. Considering permeable pavement or I mean, you've got a lot of, what, a, a third, near, you know, some quarter of the lot's paved. Um, you know, we, ha we haven't gone that quite, gotten quite that far into it yet. Uh, we've just done sort of a very preliminary assessment, um, and you know, Dave has just started to do the engineering. We haven't looked yet into uh, the feasibility of permeable paving, but that's something we could certainly take a look at, sure. Um, yeah, just question. So the, the location of the dumpster uh, is on the side of the building where the employees park, but I think the presentation is you have to walk all the way around the building to get in. Is there another exit or entrance? Um, on that side of the parking lot, where people would be able to access the dumpster, are they going to be dragging bags all the way around the building? No, no. The, the main entrance to the building here, where, yeah. where visitors would be coming into, employees primarily would probably be using a rear entrance right here. You can actually see oh, there is of, be. there's a set of stairs there, as well as there's okay. a ramp that leads down to the lower level. Yep. Um, and uh, the uh, employees that will be doing the, the cleaning and, and uh, so forth will be able to remove some of that uh, through this back entrance and then. Uh, deposit in the dumpster area here. What about a loading area for, I mean, imagine you're going to get deliveries of food and other stuff. Where is that going to be loaded in and out? Uh, we anticipate a, 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 a truck coming into this back parking lot area um, and doing whatever loading they need to do of just basic um, supplies, food, whatnot. Um, actually, how often do they come? Do you know? Once a week. Once a week, so it's pretty minimal. So we're not talking an 18 wheeler coming in, we're talking. Just a small box truck. Box truck. Yep. Okay. And you're not allowing for any residential parking? No, no, that will include the residential parking as well. Uh, the, 20, the 29 spaces. 29 spaces, t typically in, in, in an assisted living of 83 units. If I have three or four residents that bring their car, that would be a lot. Are you going to have to designate some of those spots as for deliveries? Uh, um, well, right, if you, I don't have a pointer, but. <laughs> All right, thank you. They'll be right up here, up and up close by where the where the where the delivery air, entry area is. Yeah. But I see the drop off and the where the residents could be parking is right up and over here. Yeah. 
and you're going to have a nurse on staff, but you're not providing skilled nursing care. No skilled nursing care at all, but we will have 24-hour uh, certified nursing assistants or home health aides that will be on staff, awake staff 24-7. Will the residents be doing any cooking in the rooms? Resi they will have a microwave. They will not have a stove top. There will be country kitchens where they could use a stove top if they had if they chose to. I'm sure what a country kitchen is. It's a, a it's a dining room. Oh, so they could <laughs> not within their room. They would not have within to their room. They, they will have a microwave in their room so they could you know they heat up soup a, a, or, or right. popcorn or something of that nature. Right. But any any cooking that they actually wanted to do would have to be in a common area in yeah. the, in that dining room atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Will there be uh, some kind of a room that could be used by a neighborhood association or rented? That very question. It, it wouldn't be rented. It would be um, what we would do is on the first floor, which okay. right over in here is all common space area, and over in here as well. And those areas will be, you know, can be used by the Village Hill Association as well. Uh, the average room will hold up around 30 people or so, just to kind of give you an idea. It's our main activity room when we bring in outside entertainment, have a exercise class or program, that's where we typically have it, is right downstairs in that area. It's actually quite typical. We run four other assisted livings within Massachusetts, similar types of concept, and it, it's beautiful because the community is able to, to use the space that we have as well, and our residents being part of the community get the benefit of having something in their home. So. And these will be rental units? Rental units, correct. Strictly uh, monthly rentals. Okay. Um, the way the, um, I'm looking at the planting plant as well as the, the uh, driveways and parking, and it doesn't look like you're going to have anywhere to push snow. Uh, it looks like the, the driveways, I'm sorry, the, the parking lots are pretty much planted on, around all the borders. So you're going to be pulling or hauling the snow off? Yeah, we could, we could uh, haul the snow off. That's not a problem. Typically in our buildings, we do get a contract to be able to take away snow as well. Right, well, because I, I can't see where you push it. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't see, unless you took up parking spaces. Parking spaces to be able to do so. Right. Exactly. And then the front, where the turnaround is, there's nowhere to push it. So uh, I don't see how you're going to get away without having to truck all the snow off. Yep. It, 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 we are in, in one of our buildings is right in downtown Attleboro. We have the same issue. And with the snowplow company that we use, we do have a truck away when it becomes an overabundance of it. Well, I guess that's why my point, overabundance is going to be any. Because I, 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 I don't see anywhere for you to push snow. Right. So I, 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 I'm not sure if we want to make a condition, but uh, that there's no snow storage on site. But I, without taking up either parking or parts of the streets, there's just nowhere to put it. I don't think you really need to make it a condition. I think it's going to be self-enforcing. Really? They can't right. put it on the bike path. They can't put it. You know. Yeah, you can't put it in the bike path. I mean, it's <laughs> <has laughs> a retention pond. You they have green space in the corner, but you right. know it is landscape. It's all planted. It's right. So. Everything's pretty much planted. Yeah. So, okay. If I mean, I mean, it's it's comparable to downtown. So. Right. I just hate to come up and see the new plantings covered in snowed piles. I have to replant in the spring. Yeah, that's a that's pretty spring. expensive. <laughs> Is there some kind of shared parking? That, like, did I see that? Or was that a different project? Well, with no, the male attendance, yeah. there's shared access. Is that what you're... Um, yeah, I, I didn't know yeah. whether it was just the shared, it's just the access. Well, are they going to have to grant an easement to that parcel as part of this? Yeah, because you don't want any more curb cuts on Village Hill Road. But I, that, I recommended that in the staff conditions that um, that be recorded before construction starts so that it's clear. That that's shared access. So that's going to be the entrance for any parking for the male attendance building down the road. That that, that area I, that maybe, parking I, in front of the male. I don't know what building. the future layout for the parking is. There may be some uh, other arrangements as secondary arrangements for that parking. But at this time, what's in front of you is the potential for accessing parking from right. this site from the same driveway curb cut. Right. right. I just hate to think that in any way that's closing paving the entire front of the male attendance building to put in parking like it shows on that diagram. Right, but it also goes into the back right. side too. So, yeah, I mean, you you have to approve right. whether that parking goes there or not. Okay. Right. Just an observation that often the people that are visiting people in assisted living, which are often elders, are also elders themselves. And it seems a very long way to walk from that parking lot to the front door. Um, I typically see adult children that do. So what they'll do is they'll drop, drop off the resident in this area here and then pull around to the side to be able to park here and then cut through where the bike path is. That's the benefit of having that here. And our entrance is only right here. 
but they could be elders themselves. Sure. <laughs> So it just seems a long way to walk to ask someone who's coming to visit. Right, but there are, Stu, you got to remember as well, there are, there is some, which I know is minimal, but there is some parking that's up front as well. Any other questions? Open up the public. Is there anyone here from the public who wants to weigh in on this project? Nobody. Okay. So has DPW has signed off? So would it make sense to come up with uh, conditions before we close the public hearing? I'm just curious in case somebody has. Yeah, to wouldn't, to it. wouldn't hurt. You want to go? Um, I'm going to go through the yeah. conditions that were in the staff memo. Yep. Okay. Um, and then I'll. As I'm going through this, incorporate the comments from that just came today from DPW, basically addressing the details. Um, prior to issuing the building, um, and, sorry, let me just back up again. This is a plan approval because the overall special permit for Village Hill has been approved. So this is really looking at the technical aspects of the use and whether the use is allowed. Um, Prior to issuance of building permit, the following items shall be performed. The applicant shall finalize and revise plans to incorporate conditions herein and changes made from the original filing. Plan sh set shall be delivered to the Office of Planning and Development. The applicant shall show proof of recording of shared access and drainage easements for the driveway off Village Hill Road. It will be shared with Lot 112. Uh, and approval not required plan shall be submitted, endorsed, and recorded changing the lot boundaries between lot 110 and 112. The issue is the way that um, mass development originally configured the lots is slightly different than what's shown. The amended stormwater calculation should be submitted to Department of Public Works for the overall Northampton State Hospital permit. Plan changes shall include items identified in the Department of Public Works memo with regard to corrections to plan references and plan sheets. Um, uh, we didn't talk about this before, but it was in the staff comments that uh, about the Douglas fir surrounding the parking lot is quite a massive tree and might create areas where it may be harder to see through. And I think given that it's on the bike path that you should have visual penetration between the parking lot and the bike path. Um, so Douglas fir surrounding the parking lot, my recommendation is that it should be replaced with the lower growth shrubs. Um, the applicant may opt not to landscape the exterior, oh, and, um, or, you know, limb up those trees. So mm -hmm. um, that could be an option. The applicant can opt not to landscape the exterior of the fence dumpster, um, because that's where a lot of the Douglas fir work is, and it's already fenced, then it's screened. It may not be necessary. Um, final planting shall be shown on the revised plans. Tree planting detail in accordance with the city's tree specification shall be incorporated into the final plans. And then street tree protection detail shall be incorporated into the final plans. That's for the existing street trees along Mosier and Village Hill because they were already planted and the building is coming so close to the sidewalk there. Um, bike loops shall be incorporated into the final plan set as discussed and presented. Any street trees along the property boundaries that are damaged during construction or show decline up to one year after a certificate of occupancy has been issued shall be replaced by the applicant in accordance with street trees and tree planting standards. And if the public sidewalk is damaged during construction, the applicant is responsible for repairing damage in accordance with Department of Public Works standards. Any other, we need to uh, talk about snow removal, but we don't need to Make that a condition. Bike racks are in there. Bike racks were shown. Yep. Any other conditions? Comments? In absence of any other public comment, then I move we close, close the public hearing. Second. Second. Second, John. All in favor? Okay, so this is site plan. Um, and you seem to have met everything. We've got eight to ten conditions on top of that. Um, any other discussion? 
When we did the uh, office building that's at the end of Kant Street, we put in um, rain catch basins in the parking lot. Is that wasn't there for that? On Kant Street? That office building that's uh, at, the, at the hotel. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm just, this is one big open parking lot. Is there any interest in talking about that? Is, is that something we can't do? Is that? Well, what would it's be, well, I mean, that would provide, you know, some place to store small amounts of snow. It would provide permeability. It would break up the parking lot. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they've optimized the space with every square inch. So I don't know if there's even a, a way to get any, you know, to keep their number of parking places and and get any of that. Just you're trying, to, you're talking about, you're talking about infiltration Is that what you're about? in the parking lot. Oh. Islands, earthen, you know, catch basin island in the park. I don't know yeah. that there's. Oh, I mean, it's two rows. That's the standard. Sort of once you go beyond two, then you start talking about doing the island. Okay. That makes exactly what I. Think. And then I think the fact that it's surrounded by green, and that potentially they will be able to infiltrate some of the roof runoff, addresses. It's pretty that. small parking lot. So I think you, if you added. You'd have to lose green to get green, you know. Right. And the fact that the they've got the basin across the street, they're dumping into that basin number three is, is right there. Yeah, yeah, it's right here. Yeah. It seems like it's a tight, it's kind of a funky site, and the parking lot is small to begin with, and it's jammed in there. Kind of weird. From a standpoint, I, I don't finish it. It's a lot better than lot 19, though. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's another discussion. Uh, any other comments from anybody? No. No? Someone want to make a motion? Fine. Uh, I move that we grant the request for a site plan approval major project by the Grantham Group to construct an 83-room, 58,000-square-foot assisted living facility on Village Hill Road. Northampton map ID 38A-110 with the uh, conditions as noted. Second. Second, Devin. All in favor? There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next up, I'd like to open up a request for site plan approval with parking reduction for expansion of parking facility for Clark School Bell Hall at 47 Round Hill Road, Northampton map ID 31B-64. is here tonight from Clark Schools and uh, also Richard Klein, principal of Berkshire Design Group. Um, so Clark Schools is planning to consolidate its services to Bell Hall. Currently, uh, in this aerial photo, uh, this is Round Hill Road, Henshaw Avenue is down here, and the campus is on the uh, north side or um, west side, sorry of uh, Round Hill Road is the main campus. And on the east side here is Bell Hall, Hubbard, and Rogers. So this is Bell Hall, and this photo shows the rear area. Um, with uh, the consolidation, um, Bell Hall uh, would be um, occupying a separate new lot um, which would be formed through an a, the A&R process. Um, there, is currently, there is currently not enough parking at the uh, facility to um, serve you know, those needs. So uh, this proposal is for a parking expansion at Bell Hall. Um, and we're also asking for a 20% reduction in um, the parking requirements. I'm just going to flip through these pretty quickly. I know you said uh, we should try to get through this, but these are just some photos of the front of the current uh, building, Bell Hall, from the front. A couple of shots uh, around the side and the rear of Bell Hall. If you're familiar with it, there's a small uh, play area on the, um, on the hillside in the back, and then it slopes down uh, to a pretty much an open, kind of an open 
I guess, recreation field, if you will, uh, going toward Henshaw Avenue. Uh, this aerial view shows in red the current um, east side of uh, Clark Sue's property in red, and this yellow line represents the proposed lot that would be cut out for uh, the Bell Hall facility or the new Bell Hall um, consolidation. I'm not going to bother with that one. That was just a neighborhood uh, abutters map. Now, this is um, the plan that was previously approved. Uh, as part of the overall uh, Clark School's campus improvement, which included some um, uh, additional parking and driveways, et cetera. Um, what this plan shows is that this parking lot here in the rear of Bell Hall, uh, what that, how that was configured. On this plan, um, we've overlaid the proposed property line shown here in the heavy line. Um, and I want you to take note of, you know, where the parking came down at this uh, northerly, north uh, easterly corner here, compared with what we're uh, proposing now in 2012 with the property line. Uh, the parking has been pulled back. There's been an um, overall reduction in the amount of pavement um, for the project. Uh, we do have, uh, according to the use um, schedule, we are required to have uh, 80, what was it? 89 spaces with the 20 percent reduction um, of 17 spaces we is that right I know that we have so we're, we need 71 spaces total now 71 spaces is going to be made up of these new spaces in the back 43 spaces and existing eight spaces out front here with two additional spaces um, added to the side and then um, Clark schools has off-site um, uh, by right-of-way and easement on Smith College property here, 18 spaces. Uh, so that totals 71. Um, we, this proposal will complete a drainage system that was designed to handle stormwater that would have treated this amount of pavement. Since we're reducing the amount of pavement by some um, 1,500 square feet, uh, we've contacted Doug McDonald and um, the city stormwater coordinator and sent him the revised plans and um, we've conversed with him and um, he's satisfied that if we build the storm system as designed for the 2005 facility it obviously will should handle the uh, the stormwater from the current proposal which is a, a reduction in pavement as I mentioned um, we just got um, uh, an email from Doug this afternoon Carolyn I don't know if you got that but an um, amended stormwater permit uh, we requested an amended stormwater permit from the approved 2005 stormwater permit and um, with some um, data that was sent to him, um, he issued a, an amended stormwater permit. So okay. I think that's taken care of. We do have to record the uh, operation and maintenance agreement. Um, that uh, was also received today and we'll um, fill that out and have the owner review it, have Doug give the final review before um, that that uh, document is prepared and sent to the mayor for signature and then reported. Um, and I'm just going to basically end with this uh, slide that kind of shows Bell Hall, then the, the paved areas, and then all the green and these walkways as open. Um, and I'm going to open it up to any comments from from the board at this point. You just. Walk me through again the, the 18 spaces that uh, you have by easement. How do you physically get there? Oh, um, well, currently there's a there's a walkway that kind of it's a very steep walkway that goes down the hill, basically from where you exit the building up here in existing conditions and walk down the hill. You can see remnants of that walk here. It would have extended up the hill to roughly in this location. Now, um, if anybody uses these. 18 offsite spaces, uh, they would have to kind of walk up through this driveway and up this staircase that were, is part of the proposal and then into the building. Now, I do want to mention that the easement and right of way is a vehicular parking and pedestrian easement. So that, that runs from um, Round Hill Road all the way down through here, includes these spaces, and then comes out to Henshaw. And, um, I did include a slide for reference of the survey, and if you can 
can kind of see the parking areas here. You, if you can see that patched area, that's indicated that's the uh, um, parking and pedestrian easement that's been granted by Smith back to Clark School. So um, I'm not sure exactly if these 18 spaces are used um, very often by Clark. You know, obviously it's kind of in a in a uh, area that's you know below the building, but they are there um, for Clark's use. And um, from what I understand, that the uh, some of the offices that Clark has are actually in Tilly Hall, which is right here. So I guess that space is leased, and then you know those those um, per those personnel use these spaces, um, you know, that are in that parking lot. So so does that mean? They're Smith's spaces, but you have access to them? That's correct. It's Smith uh, property okay. with an easement to Clark School for that use. Does that mean that Smith has access to them as well? Um, I don't know. Smith is, is does not have access to the spaces. Um, so if you're not using them, they're empty? That's correct. I actually think there's a little trading back and forth that happens, but from uh, what I see, that th those spaces don't ever seem to be um, Fully used. Are they they somehow marked and say parking for Clark School only? I uh, I don't think there's signs there actually. There is, are there signs? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. There are signs, and those spaces are numbered on the pavement as well. Um, there's other spaces you see in these in these unhatched areas. Those are for Smith use. There's also signs. There. I think they park. Um, what are those? Those uh those cars. Zip, zip cars. cars. They park zip cars there. And down in this lower lot, they park um, Smith Park's uh, vans that the school uses. So Smith does use portions of those lots, but from what I understand, I don't think that they ever use any of the lots that are designated in this uh, on the uh, northern end of that lower lot. What's Tilly Hall going to be used for? It's not part of the lot. No, it isn't. Um, it's currently, is it shared right now, or is it just for, yeah, is it just Clark use? We leased that from Smith, and our business office is uh, in Oh, okay, so you also have access to these, mm -hmm. which are not in that easement, but I guess with the rental of Tilly Hall, Clark is also has access to those as well. from the board anyway. They need a stormwater permit for us? They need an, they needed an, an amendment. amendment. Right. A an amended permit from previously approved. That's right. correct. Right. right. And there were some DPW comments. Um, as got well. those as far as yeah, I mean some of them I included in the staff report about state uh, excuse me, slope stabilization on the back side because the grades are so um, okay. severe. And then there were other questions about um, from DPW and I think noted in my staff report about um, uh, the retaining wall. Can you describe that a little bit? It looked like on the plans that there was an existing retaining wall that was being partially oh, covered. Oh. and. Um, this down at the lower end of the site here, there's the remnants of a, a, a foundation and I, I'm not sure what that building was in the past, but it's a concrete foundation, and um, the slope from this parking lot would come down, and uh, we're proposing just to leave that concrete foundation in place and, and kind of bury this end right there. So It's not a retaining wall, then? It's not a retaining wall. It's just an old foundation, and it's actually, you know, there's a, you know, if you stand on top of it, there's like a two and a half, three foot drop off of it, so it's, um, I'm not sure if kids try to go down there to play at this point, but it's, it's really kind of an unused area. Um, and rather than just, you know, trying to save, save a little money by leaving it alone. Stephen? Do you want to talk about, uh, Carolyn, you had a note in the trap in the <coughs> staff report about um, proposed, this traffic statement says there will be an overall reduction in traffic? Right. How was that going to come about? Well, I saw that comment, and, and I think you might have misinterpreted the, the response. 
What that comment said is there would be an overall reduction in the flow of traffic throughout the neighborhood because right now cars are, you know, would come up the hill and pass this site and keep going north and go to Hubbard and Rogers as well as turning in to go to the uh, west side of the campus. With uh, Clark, Clark School consolidating to one building essentially, you know, traffic's going to be limited to coming up and going into this driveway or this driveway. So the cars that used to go beyond this site and continue through the neighborhood street to other um, buildings, you know, that, that's not going to occur anymore. So I think that's what the uh, response uh, meant in the application, not that there was a reduction in the amount of traffic. Um, is it realistic? Grant 20% in the required parking, and also they have 18 spaces that nobody's going to use. Is there going to be enough with 53 spaces? Is that realistic? Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think it, there could be two things, and the applicant can, de or Mike can describe, but once the consolidation happens, parking won't be happening elsewhere, so people may, in fact, start using that lower lot. Um, I think the um, there's no other place to park. There's no other, no other spillover effect, essentially, because, and I think, you know, like in um, some of the other districts in the city, um, you have accommodated folks saying, this is what our, this is what our, demand is so this is these are only the number of spaces we need I think that's sort of what's being shown here the parking lot was bigger in the first iteration <coughs> they've reduced that so presumably they could go back to that original expanded parking lot but there's no need to do that which is why they're asking for the 20 percent reduction so I don't see that really as an issue um, there'll be more green space in this iter in this scenario and given that there's already um, accessible parking on the adjacent lot I don't I, I, is that in fact the case? You don't need the spaces? Um, well, uh, Clark has um, produced a, a memo stating, you know, with a count that basically says they need about 59 or 60 spaces. So there might be a few extras in this proposal. Um, but I think that it's not, I mean, we're asking for the 20. I, I, I think zoning does allow us to, to ask for a bigger reduction. Right. right, you can ask for more with a special permit. Right. 20% is sort of the threshold right. between site plan and, and special permit. I don't think that's such a bad idea because um, as it is right now, people do pull up and park on the street. And with this parking facility in the back, I think that um, once people know it's there, it's going to encourage people not to pull, uh, stop at the curb, if you will, and maybe they'll pull in and get off the street. And that's always a good idea. <clears throat> So the original 89 is based on the square footage of the building. And what they've done is actually determined the use of the building once you're consolidated. Yep. Any other questions from the board? Uh, is there anyone from the public no. to talk about this specific item? Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Um, if you could come up to the podium and state sure. your name and address. Hi, I'm, I'm Sarah Metcalf. I live in the neighborhood. And um, I'm actually here primarily to comment on the, on the other site plan for the campus. But um, there's a, an issue that's kind of common to the two of them, and that's pedestrian rights of way. Um, we've been looking very closely at the anticipated increased traffic up Round Hill Road and um, a large group of neighbors are very concerned with preserving existing, existing pedestrian paths that will help to reduce the load of traffic up and down Round Hill Road. And there's a very much used path currently that goes from Round Hill Road um, on this map to the right of Bell Hall and, and goes down to that lower parking lot and exits on the Henshaw. And it looks as though basically that path disappears and that the only way a pedestrian can now walk through in wintertime when things would be snow covered would be down a driveway where, you know, there's nothing devoted to a pedestrian. It would be, you know, 
in traffic. I mean, I think that's a pretty, a pretty unattractive option. And so I'm just wondering if this plan could conceivably be amended in such a way as to create um, a pedestrian path that would continue to, to lead down around kind of to the right side from, from Round Hill Road and, and exit out at, at its current exit point down into that lower lot that belongs to Tilly Hall. Um, you know, because a, a very direct and appealing uh, and much used and well maintained and beautifully <laughs> cleared sidewalk has, has uh, I guess, been eliminated now. And then the other thing that I, I just would like to comment on is that currently this is uh, an area that has a lot of um, pretty beautiful trees, including a really large oak, which I think is slated to come down for this parking lot. Uh, and, it's, and it's one of those uh, trees that was donated by some people at Clark. It has a little commemorative placard on it. It's, you know, a 44-inch diameter tree. Just wonder if it's in any way possible to, you know, skirt around that or, you know, I mean, it's the single most notable tree that apparently is going to be sacrificed for pavement here. Um, but there are a number of other very beautiful trees that are coming down and then, you know, I'm not exactly sure that I see where the landscaping that's plotted here is going to is going to replace any of those, and uh, and that would be a shame because right now it's a very beautiful area. Do you want to speak to any of that? Mike? I'm, I'm not sure if I have any comments. I'm, I'm not. I think I might disagree with the pedestrian access because once you go down along the north side of Bell Hall, you have to cross, it seems like you have to cross an open field to get to Henshaw. There's no paved access. No, believe me, there's, there are paths now. I, I walk them daily. <laughs> uh, Rick Klein from Chittas Anger. Um, I think historically Clark has been nice enough to let people walk across the property, even with liability issues and school children and so on. Um, Clark has, as you know, is consolidating quite a bit and, and not really shoehorning into the site, but trying to really consolidate it down to the bare bones. Um, and with the slopes that are there, Trying to put a new sidewalk that would be ADA compliant uh, is really difficult. And the, the, the thought was that there still is that easement up through Tilly and through Clark, and that's plowed up and so on. And so you know, that's the logistical way for people to get from one road to the next. Yeah, I'm not sure if we can put make a, a private owner put a public sidewalk through their, their property so that the neighbors can walk across. I don't right. think we can. That's not something we can even do. But that being said, you're saying in the end there'll still be a paved, it's vehicular and pedestrian access that will be presumably be paved. So there would be access from. That's correct. The driveway to the left, Kelly, there will be as plowed on. So you could pop up out and at Henshaw along a paved route the whole way. Sure. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I would just add that this is Foster 87 Round Hill Road, so I live very close to this. Um, I would just say that the, you know, I don't know what the solution is, but the pavement piece, it's dangerous. You know, I have two small kids that do walk that exact route, and you're right, it's the generosity of Clark School that we have access to that. But I have to say that the solution saying, well, there is a pedestrian with vehicles and pedestrians, I'm not sure what Clark School is going to do about their own pedestrians, you know, because it doesn't sound like it's super safe for them either. But um, just saying that, well, either, you know, kids are still going to walk down there. So it, it, the solution isn't to ignore it and say, well, it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. And I just think that that should maybe get a little bit of thought because, you know, even if it is a pedestrian or paved, somewhere distinguishing where cars go and children go isn't crazy. So that's my two cents. Okay. Yep. Janet Gross, 38 Round Hill Road. <clears throat> and I have a question about the parking area in front of Bell Hall. Um, 
I don't know if the addition of the two spaces means that Clark anticipates more clients for the hearing center. Um, my concern is that all these service vehicles that come to Bell Hall park on the road right now rather than coming into the parking area. Uh, these are the growing uh, FedEx trucks and the growing UPS trucks. Um, often they park along the curb, um, obstructing traffic, especially traffic that's trying to come north on Round Hill Road. Then there are the big Poland Spring trucks. Um, the other day there was a semi. Uh, it's not the first time I've seen a semi parked out there. And I wondered if any consideration has been given to some sort of a service entrance where these vehicles can park. Okay. And I do have another concern I would just like to point out briefly, and that is that the exit uh, from the um, parking area, again, the bell in the front, is exactly opposite the exit from the west side of the Clark School. Soon that will be um, the only entrance exit for um, the majority of the vehicles that will be going into and coming out from the new development. And it is less than 50 feet from a um, drive that is shared by five residential units and um, were the park drive a city street as opposed to a private way um, the distance from the drive would have to be 50 feet it is currently 42 um, because there are problems with um, turning around in that shared drive you see these huge um, oil trucks that have to back in and also vehicles go in there and end up backing out. And I just would like to point that out as a potential problem. And certainly with the increase in traffic, it is an accident ready. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Discussion? I mean, I think you know, we've talked about we can't require them to put in a public path. So I, I, I'm just not sure if that's, you know, what we're going to do about that. Um, and I think the idea of the, the service vehicles parking on the street, I'm not sure. What that's I'm not sure if we have purview to tell FedEx they can't park on the street. Um, that's just where people park when they're making deliveries. It happens in front of every house that I know of. Um, downtown too. Happens downtown. I mean, if you try to go around Thorns when somebody's you know parked in front of Thorns. Um, so I just I, I I don't you know it's kind of we don't really have the the purview to tell FedEx they can't park on the street. Well, there's some possibility that the parking lot behind it will be. It, it's obviously closer to the building than the street, so that could go in exactly the other direction from that. They could be encouraged to come down in there to drop off. Right. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the idea that, that they are claiming the spaces that Smith has. I'm being told those aren't being used. I mean, they could very easily be, you know, Smith <coughs> can reconfigure in a way that uses those spaces so the, the 18 spaces by easement are being counted with this building, and yet they are uh, available to another facility. And they aren't providing a very uh, convincing access point for pedestrians to get to those places if they are going to use them. That, that I think, is a good that it's Because the existing plan does show a way to get there by crossing the path and up. Okay. Can, I, can I clarify that? Yeah. Um, 
the, the 18 spaces that are there by easement are, they belong to Smith College. They're on Smith College property. They're wholly uh, for the use of Clark School. If Clark does not want to use them, they sit empty waiting for Clark to use them. Smith will not use them. They're, they're well, what so would happen if Smith developed a need to use them? Uh, they would have to actually negotiate with Clark to, to buy them back, essentially. Yeah, Eastman's for forever, isn't it? That's correct. As long as Clark <laughs> occupies that lot and has a property line contiguous to those 18 spaces, those 18 spaces and the easement to get back and forth between Henshaw and Round Hill Road are, are deeded to Clark by easement. It's kind of well, I guess back to Devin's point, though, is there a way to provide a better access point from those 18 spaces? to Bell Hall without having to walk up and for the and across and well, it's it's a stairway to get from the curved the curved entrance in the lower left hand side it's pretty steep down to those spaces right so I think I think the thought is correct to come up here and then up those stairs right up right the there. stairs yeah but there's no way to come out the right side of those 18 spaces where the path goes comes shows coming down to uh, Henshaw. It's really steep there. Right, the grade. Is it that steep? Pretty dramatic there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The, the yeah. continual stairs. Yeah. That's part of the problem with pedestrians being there because as cars come up that driveway, it's not easy to see. And I just think if you force kids to walk down, because the main issue why kids go there, Smith College Campus School. You know, because anyone that lives up there ends up walking down here to access Smith College Campus School. And there are other places where they walk, but this is also, you know, one of them. Mm -hmm. And most most people are walking on the right-hand side of Bell Hall. There is paths. Oh, I'm kind of stymied with with Steve. You can't it's you can't private. require those right hand it's pathways to stay there. Right. No, I and they I, can. Again. The other thing is, is that, and and they, you know, they they could still be used like that. I mean, if Clark so wanted them to be. Right. If they, I'm sorry. What was the, if if Clark wanted? Well, I mean, it's an informal neighborhood arrangement right now that you could say possibly could exist in the future but I don't think we have any way to ensure that right. Right. I mean we cannot require someone to allow the public to cross over the property it happened in Cole Morgan it's happened in other parts it's not something we can do does does Tilly have a sidewalk in front or no? like from the park from, from the, the parking lot in the from the driveway to the door Yeah, I mean, I think we're struggling with a, an issue that we can enforce. Um, yep, come on up. I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about this personally since I don't use that path and I don't have. Get your name, please. Uh, pardon me, Richard Green, 88 Round Hill Road. I'm here for the uh, Opal site plan, but um, I'm not familiar with Massachusetts law on easements, but in other states, if a uh, path has been used for a certain amount of time, people have a legal right to continue to use it. Um, that might be a possibility. Okay, well, let me just talk me through this one more time. So the 18 spaces down here, could they're ADA accessible by virtue of the road back up and around that enters the parking lot area. That I don't know if they're ADA accessible. Don't they have to? I don't think with the grade, the existing, that's existing grade, and I think it's such that it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, there's handicap parking in the front, the, where the eight, where it says eight existing spaces. Mm -hmm. There's two handicapped spaces up there. Okay. Um, and then there are, in the lower area, there are none. I don't believe there are any handicapped spaces in the lower area. So the only handicapped spaces are the ones in front of the building. <coughs> no, I think we did add, I think there's a couple of handicapped spaces. Are there two in the bottom? Am I just missing? Oh, actually, there's a better picture. Yeah, there's two. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. two right across from the entrance. So there's two more down in the lower area. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't get any. 
Nicholas Gross, GROSS. Um, I just want to say that now Yeah, that's what I was. I was headed to say to yeah. put stairs there, but that's still possible. Uh, comments still. Right. Open. Questions? Do we have any? I move we close public comment. I move we close public Second. comment. Second, Stephen. All in favor. Uh, Carolyn, you want to go through the conditions from um. staff? Um, so we, we talked about slope stabilization um, should be included for all slopes of um, three to one or greater, and that was in the DPW comments. Um, <coughs> annual stormwater management agreement must be in place in accordance with the original permit. Uh, this will need to be finalized, signed, and recorded prior to commencement of work. Um, all and DPW's uh, um, Doug McDonald also sort of reiterated that in their. Um, in their review. All easements for offsite drainage will need to be in place before commencement of work. There are two areas that I, the applicant didn't talk about, but um, one, that's a, they're both sort of, one's a historic line that goes south towards Henshaw across that property, and then the other is what will potentially be the future Opal property for Hubbard and Rogers. There's a um, drainage area there. So those need to be um, finalized and recorded before work is done. Um, and um, DPW recommends that um, ADA um, requirements for um, tactile warning strips on that um, ramp going into the back building should be incorporated in the design. Um, and that's it. Comments. I think that you know our the, this was approved before, and now it's coming in front of us again. Re reduced parking, and the the comments about pedestrian access are valid, but they're not for us. I don't think enforceable. It would, might be good practice for Clark if this work was done to find a way to make the situation better. Same thing with service vehicles up front. That's, I don't, we can't make that a condition. But if Clark makes it a condition, then they can come around in the back or something. Um, so I think we're limited as, as to what we can and cannot condition. Well, and if this were a developer telling me what the parking requirements would be and they were proposing a 20% reduction, I would, I would be more concerned about it, but this is the user itself right. who has every incentive to have the right amount of parking for their function. Right. So I, I have some confidence in, in the fact that they've, they've gone about trying to figure that out. Yeah, and when I think about the, the pedestrian path, every building that's ever been built used to have a path on it. So to say that historically any parcel that had a path on it has to have a path on it in perpetuity just, it just doesn't fly. So. Do I hear a motion? I move we approve the request for site plan approval for parking reduction for expansion of parking facility for Clark School Bell Hall at 47 Round Hill Road, Northampton, map ID 31B-64 with conditions as noted. Second. Second, Stephen. All in favor? Thank okay, thank you. Thank you.
It's 10 after 9. I'd like to open up a request for site plan approval to convert historical educational buildings to residential and mixed office use and a special permit for reduction in parking for property at Clark School, Round Hill Road, Northampton Map ID 31B-46. And we've got a presentation. All right. Hello. My name is Darren Gray from Doucette Associates. I'm a civil engineer representing the Opal Group. Um, also here tonight, we have Regis Palantagas with the Opal Group. I get it? No, you murdered it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dan Dodge with the Opal Group. Uh, Tom Hogan with Doucette and Associates. Uh, Sean Kelly with Vanass, a traffic engineer. Also Mike Sadal, attorney. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Demetrius to get us rolling here. It's, uh, it's almost uh, 9.13, so I'll be brief. Um, Opal Real Estate Group is uh, presently committed to five historic preservation projects in Western Mass. Uh, completed projects include the Holyoke Intermodal in coordination with um, Holyoke Community College and the Public Transit, a firehouse uh, redevelopment and preservation in the center of Holyoke Westfield State Training School, uh, which was delivered September 2nd. Uh, which is the previous Westfield Courthouse and will serve as residential units uh, for Westfield State University. Uh, we are presently the uh, preferred developer in executing an LDA on the Court Street Hotel in Springfield, Massachusetts, 137,000 square foot mixed-use project. And uh, we are participating as a main stakeholder, Union Station Development in Springfield. Um, and um, our most uh, ambitious project, I believe, uh, Clark School, which we want to start calling uh, Historic Round Hill Summit um, as an identified um, uh, name for the project. The Clark School development, uh, approximately 9.8 acres of what we consider some of the most historically significant land and buildings in Massachusetts, and uh, I would dare say the, uh, the country. Um, we have completed our historic tax application to Mass Historic Commission uh, with the assistance of the Development Department and the Northampton Historic Commission, uh, which supported our project to the Commission. It is under review with Mass Historic and National Park Service presently. Um, we have um, Spent a great deal of time, uh, almost uh, 12 months now, um, kind of honing down what this development's going to look like. It's gone through many changes. Um, we've worked very diligently with mayor's office, development personnel, um, the His Northampton Historic Commission, Round Hill neighborhood representatives, and uh, our partner, the Clark School, uh, to present this to you this evening. Um, if I have one uh, message from Opal Real Estate Group and its principal, uh, Peter Picknelli, is that this is a historic preservation um, in every sense of the word, uh, inside and outside. Um, our intent is minimal to zero impact on surrounding open land, um, minimal to zero impact on existing vegetation and the look from the curb. Uh, as you will hear tonight, we have also agreed to terms uh, with the city for a permanent historic designation of the site. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to our team and uh, let them begin. Very 
going to start off here with an overview map of the entire site, just to get everyone located here. Um, the westerly side of the campus is over here, and it's uh, bounded by Bancroft to the west, and Round Hill Road comes through the middle of the site, and then Henshaw is down below. And the easterly side of the campus, here's Bell Hall, which um, Michael just presented. This is the lots getting subdivided off, and over here is the Smith, Smith College area with that uh, easement they were discussing. You know, one of the interesting things about this project, and something that's kind of ironic when you consider how old the campus is, and it's a redevelopment project, but, you know, it really adheres a lot to the components of low-impact development, which is a very, you know, modern-day current concept. You know, we hope to have some work, live tenants here. Um, it's got dense housing and a, a walkable downtown area, access to public transit. Uh, we're very limiting, we're very much limiting the impact to impervious. We're installing a, a rain garden, which is compliant with DEP standards for a low impact stormwater design. Uh, inherent improvements to the neighborhood, as you will hear, with the uh, offsite mitigation package that's proposed. Um, and, and also, you know, obviously, as Demetrius was saying, the, the very limited impact, you know, obviously, no sprawl effect here. We're really looking to minimize impacts. Um, you know, in line with the historic preservation, you know, the exterior of these existing buildings will remain. They're not proposing any uh, modifications. Uh, no major site work. You know, we'll go through it all in, in detail here, but it's, it's all pretty minimal and to enhance safety and circulation and uh, very minor adjustments for parking. And um, again, just one of the core values of this project is maintaining that historic character here on site. And uh, we have worked very closely with the Office of Planning and Development with our submittal package and the, the calculations and also with DPW Engineering and Stormwater Group, Doug McDonald. We got our we, um, notification that our waiver was approved today from the Stormwater Group and also the Engineering Group. It appears we have a you know, general consensus uh, on the direction of the mitigation package and, uh, and how that will all be put into effect. <clears throat> and uh, one of the more complicated things about this project is that it's, it's going to be a phased renovation. Um, and so what Opal Group did early on here, as they were looking at this project, was to do a conceptual analysis on the inside of the buildings. You know, this is a very atypical office space we're talking about here. Obviously, historic renovation is educational buildings. And uh, they don't lend themselves to the most efficient use of space as if you're doing a ground up or on an empty site or something. You know, so they went through these buildings you know, floor by floor, piece by piece, to evaluate what would be required for life safety and access and what could actually be used for office space. And I'll get into that in more detail, but that's, that's a really a, a driving factor behind a lot of this when you start talking about the parking reduction. And, and again, with the parking reduction is the, um, the historic preservation on this, this lot. As you look at the overall site map, you see a lot of green space here, which we're proposing not to impact. And uh, you know, so we're really hoping to just maintain parking with some slight enhancements, adding it where we can with limited impact. But let's um, get into the details a little bit here. Oh. So this slide zooms in on the westerly side of the campus. So again, Round Hill Road, Bancroft up here. Um, the, the buildings that are proposed to be renovated as part of this project, we have Gaywith Hall, Adams, Coolidge, and Skinner. Um, those are all going to be redeveloped as mixed use, an approximate split of 80% professional offices and 20% of, it's defined in the zoning as medical, dental, and what I deem like a high traffic office where you see as a primary part of your business, you see clients. Um, it's also proposed to have a daycare element on site. Uh, that, that's the only really deviation from the 80-20 split that's provided in the submittal calculations. The other buildings on site, we have Galbraith Gymnasium. We have the boiler room, the engineer's house, and the maintenance garage. Those are all proposed to stay as they are, support buildings, accessory. And it's important to note with the gymnasium, too, that that's in no way going to be used you know, for membership gym or anything like that. That is to, you know, as an amenity to the re remainder of the project. Could you clarify the 80-20 again? Oh, sure. Um, well, we went through the calculations for this project, you know, specifically you know, for the peak hour trips and for the parking requirements. You know, we had to project what the breakdown of uses would be in these buildings. And since, you know, they're not leased yet, it, it's all a projection of what could happen out there. And with the zoning amendment in this past spring, 
for historic, reuse of historic educational building, it allows for up to a 20% uh, medical, dental, or, or high traffic office use. And also, I believe it also introduced even the professional office, because this used to be just you know, residential. Um, and so in order to give Oval Group you know, flexibility as they go forward with their leasing, what we assumed here was that 20% of that more high usage or high traffic, if you will, office space, and 80% of the professional office. Whereas professional office is, you know, the primary function of the office is not to see clients all the time, but you know, it's more of a, a secondary function. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to project forth some numbers here, so we could, you know, develop these parking numbers and the, the peak hour trips, we had to start somewhere, and we started with the numbers that were provided in zoning, and also based them off of you know, those early on conceptual analyses of the buildings when Opal went through and, and took a look at what percentage could be leased on each, each floor. And that's the basis of the calculations for the parking reduction and the peak hour trips. So it's 80-20 divided between two types of commercial use? Yes. But it's 100% commercial use? Yes. OK, just wanted to make sure I understood. Yeah, I mean, as we're advised, you know, it's mixed use. We're not anticipating any residential on the westerly side of the campus. You know, but. Why not? <laughs> Why not? That's a great question. That's a good question. Yeah. It, the residential on that side, the um, historic, we are only applying to the National Park Service on two buildings. Uh, we had a preliminary determination by the National Park and Mass Historic. We had asked if we could apply to the campus as a whole, so it would be one submission for the entire project. That was denied. They felt that each building had very different individual characteristics historically, and some of the buildings predating the Clark School, that all of the submissions needed to be individual. So, yeah, we kind of had the same response. Uh, the problem being, though, that the the effort, the time, and um, the difficulty of doing them individually um, is just a, um, a mountain of work. Um, so we focused um, the initial submissions for Mass Historic and National Park Service on the, um, the, the two buildings that we wanted to use the residential. It had the highest density of residential and we felt we're the most um, amendable to, to that. And our big problem inside of um, these buildings is that despite the square footage number, it is a tremendous, almost 40 or above percent common area. So these buildings have, uh, are very difficult to adapt and because of historic, whether now or later, we cannot touch hallways. So that is an absolute no. Speaking of those residential buildings, Go over to the east side of the campus. We have Rogers Hall and Hubbard Hall. Um, these are currently projected to be just fully residential with 38 units overall. Um, and that's really the side of the campus what the, the plan is here. Uh, there are some site improvements which I'll run through in the next slide. And this is, let me try to zoom in a little bit here. So as I've been mentioning, you know, there's not a lot of site improvements proposed. What are proposed are for you know, safety, circulation. So I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit as I go through. But up, up here is Coolidge. And we're proposing a drop-off area here. I believe it's a 12-foot wide drive aisle with a 3-foot striped area and a sidewalk. We made sure to oversize the drive aisle and provide that extra striped area just to be sure for safety. Um, we, we've adjusted the the extent of this drive out to pull away from some of the larger trees down here at the base. We have adjusted this design. It connects up to an existing sidewalk. We're also proposing uh, five bike racks throughout the campus. We have one here at Coolidge. We have one over here at Skinner. One at, at Galbraith. There's an existing one at Gaywith. And then two for the residential side. One in the front and one in the back. Um, as far as parking adjustments go, Zoning does allow for back-to-back -back parking for residential use, so we're able to squeeze it in on the east side of the campus here, to the north of Rogers Hall. Went back-to-back. -back. There's existing nine spaces. We went eight back-to-back -back for a total of 16. 
And also the access aisle here was only wide enough for one-way traffic. So we widening that up to allow for double and you know increasing the radii slightly. And going over to the other side of the campus. Again, I mentioned the rain garden earlier, and up here at the Coolidge drop-off, that's really the only significant area of the first being added to the site. To accommodate any additional stormwater runoff, we have a, a, hundred, a, um, a rain garden proposed for this area, and it handles the 100-year storm designed per DEP guidance, that low-impact stormwater design practice. Sorry to keep moving it around, everyone. I'm just trying to like, zoom in so everyone can see here. And behind Gaywith, we're just looking at adjusting the curb line slightly to add in five more spaces. North of, sorry, they said be west of Adams. We're adding in two more spaces. And again, when we add in these spaces, we're only doing this in areas where it's immediately accessible and available space. We're not pulling in any drive aisles and putting new parking areas anywhere. Again, maintaining the historic character of this campus. And again, over here, adding two, which is just adding those in there. And behind Skinner, there are three new spaces proposed, and that's just simply a matter of restriping to get those in there. Um, also, which is considered on-site improvements um, by uh, zoning ordinance, by planning, is new granite curbing along the frontage for the parcels. Uh, so that's going to be included. I believe also the, the restriping of the crosswalks is included as, as on-site. And so that's, uh, that really summarizes the on-site improvements for the project. Um, we'll get into the off-site, which judging from some of the comments I heard, I think some of the neighbors would be happy about. But now, moving on to the, let me just check my notes here, make sure I didn't miss anything on you, but. Moving on to the, the calculations for the project. I, you know, they were pretty in-depth, detailed, and for me, painful, <laughs> but um, I do want to talk about them in a general sense to, to, again, just further explain the methodology behind the calculations that they are, the basis for the parking reduction request, and also for the, the traffic mitigation fee. Now, I spoke earlier, and so did Demetrius, about how Opal went through and evaluated these buildings and found there was a lot of space that couldn't be used. Just can't touch the hallways, life safety, and just the inherent inefficiencies with the reuse of these historic buildings. But Zoning ordinance requires all calculations be done according to gross building square footage. So our traffic calculations, or traffic report, is all done with based on gross building areas. And our traffic engineer will get into that more closely. But so are our parking numbers, and also the peak hour trips, which are done per equations in the zoning ordinance based on gross area. Now, so do, to summarize it quickly, we said we we evaluate the numbers based on gross area, and then in working with the planning department, we develop equations to apply reductions to more accurately represent what is expected from this campus. On the westerly side, we're looking at only about 63% utilization of the gross building area, for instance. And so we were able to apply a reduction, and then also we, we applied a, a factor of safety on that of 12% to bump it back up to make sure we're accommodating what's required by zoning. You know, the ITE trip generation handbook states that on average for an office building, they have a 12% just accessory use. You know, your hallways, your mechanical, and that sort of thing. So we applied that back in. After we put our reduction in, we added some back in to make sure we're you know, being consistent with what's expected of a current day office building. And you know, from that, we developed, oops, developed our trips. And you know, again, we're going for this, the reduction and some important things to note about the site are that obviously with the residential on the east side and then the commercial or office on the west, we have staggered peaks. You know, as people are leaving in the morning to go to work, other folks are arriving to their jobs on the west side of the campus and vice versa in the evening commute. So we do have the staggered peaks, which is specifically mentioned in the zoning ordinance. Obviously, this site is very walkable to downtown. There's public transit within walking distance. We're adding all the five large bike racks. Um, and you know, again, you know, we're hoping for a work-live component here too. It's pretty ideal for that type of use. So I'm going to go on to the next slide here. I made sure to you know insert my six pages of calculations because because they're so painful to create. But, um, so you know, in the end, if you look at our adjusted trips, our adjusted parking, I should say, 
versus what we have on site, we're looking at it's about 22 point, it's a 22.7 percent reduction versus the adjusted numbers. We have 180 on site, and the adjusted number is 233. And now, as I'm talking about the adjusted numbers, I'm just going to take a quick step back and talk about what these numbers are going to represent going forward. Um, I keep referring to them as allowable parking spaces and allowable peak hour trips that we came to through working with the city, developing these calculations. So you know, as Opal goes forward and phases in the renovations of these buildings, as I mentioned, it's not all leased out. This is going to be a phased project. As they go through, based on demand, they'll be phasing these buildings in. They'll have something of an account with the city for the parking spaces and the peak hour trips. So as the new spaces are getting leased and they have to go through and get a building permit, go through the approval process with the city, they'll essentially deduct those from the account. And so what's going to be in that account is going to be a direct result of the planning board's decision tonight. And we hope to get that 20% reduction to allow that 233 adjusted spaces. Um, so I've been mostly talking about the parking, but the peak hour trips, as a result of those, you know, there, it is shown that there's a, a small impact specifically on the Round Hill Road southerly approach to Route 9, that the level of service drops. And so there is a mitigation, off-site mitigation uh, factor included in this project. And so Opal and the city have agreed on 103,000. Know, this again comes back to these calculations that, I, that were pulled together. Of 103,000, um, specific items that are going to be implemented aren't yet determined. The number is determined. And you know, some of the possibilities that have been discussed are, are uh, some raised crosswalks, you know, signage, possibly removing on-street parking on, on uh, Round Hill Road to an extent. And, uh, but the removal of on-street parking, which I know some of the, the neighbors have been talking about, that does have to go from the DPW to City Council, and there's a, a process for that. That's one of the things that's been discussed. And also some um, you know, lighted pedestrian actuation as well in the immediate project area. Again, the mitigation fee will be applied to projects in the project area. This isn't for stuff you know, up on King Street, and this is for the immediate project area you know, where you'd expect the impacts to be felt. Yes, speed bumps and the raised crosswalks. Um, and specifically for Round Hill Road, obviously Round Hill Road residents are here. There's discussion of raised crosswalks on Round Hill Road. So, and with that, I think I'll turn it over to Sean Kelly from Panas just to give a, a brief discussion on the traffic. So, thanks, Darren. Go. It's just. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Sean Kelly. I'm a traffic engineer in Finance and Associates. Um, half of the project team, uh, thank you again for having us before you tonight. I think what I'd like to do tonight is just take a few minutes to walk you through our traffic study, um, how it was conducted, what our findings were, uh, what our recommendations are, and then I'd be more than happy to have any questions that uh, members of the board or the audience might have. Um, to start off, I, um, I think we're all familiar with the study area. Again, we're looking at the existing Clark School uh, located off of Round Hill Road. Round Hill Road essentially bisects the campus. And again, as Darren pointed out, the uh, eastern side of the campus would be uh, redeveloped into residential uses, with the western side accommodating more commercial uses. The uh, study that we prepared was done in accordance with all uh, industry, uh, local, and state guidelines. But essentially, we looked at the traffic impacts of the project um, along the Round Hill Road corridor. Uh, focusing on the, the northern and southern termini at uh, Prospect and also at Elm, which is uh, state numbered Route 9. Um, the first stage is we went out and did some existing data collection. We collected traffic volumes on a, on a daily basis as well as a peak hour basis. Um, when I talk about peak hours, the, the hours that we're really concerned with are uh, 7 to 9 in the morning and then 4 to 6 in the evening. And the reason this is critical is this is the time periods where you have the uh, residential commuter traffic, uh, the people on the east side would be coming in. Uh, going to work and coming back in the evening. And then also on the west side, you would have commuter traffic where employees are arriving in the morning and, and then going home in the evening. So the, the time periods, again, were with 7 to 9 and 4 to 6, which is in accordance with industry guidelines. Um, we also took a look at some of the safety characteristics. We collected uh, motor vehicle crash data from MassDOT for the last three years of available data uh, for both uh, Round Hill at 9 and Round Hill at Prospect. And what it showed is that um, based on the existing data, there's no safety issues out there today. Um, over three years, there were, there were two collisions um, at each location in a three-year period. Um, no fatalities reported. The 
the DOT establishes an average crash rate, which tells you how safe an intersection is, and we're well below the average crash rate. I believe we're one seventh of the actual average crash rate. Um, the next stage of our study is we take these volumes and we inflate them in a couple of ways. First, we uh, increase the volumes uh, to account for general background growth. We apply a growth factor compounded over five years, which is the state guideline. And then the, the next step is we take a look at how much traffic the project itself will generate to get a handle on, on that impact. Uh, we developed the trip generation for the project in two ways. Uh, first, we use City of Northampton uh, trip generation rates as um, indicated in your zoning ordinance. And, and then we also ran the numbers using what we call uh, ITE data, which is short for the Institute of Transportation Engineers. So we ran the generation both ways. Um, and, and I'll go through what those numbers um, bared out. But I think it's important to note um, three things um, that we took into account when we did our generation. Um, first off, this is a redevelopment project. Um, the Clark School for many years was operational, um, and, and the volumes of traffic that it generated certainly are higher than the levels that you have out there today. Um, information we got from the school indicated that they had uh, full-time staff of over 100 employees arriving at 8, uh, leaving at 4 um, for many years. They had, they had bus drop-offs, uh, 60 buses coming and going on a weekly basis. They had deliveries. They had drop-off of kids. So the, the volumes of traffic that um, historically were at the school certainly are not there today. And in, in many studies of this type, what we would do is we'd compare a matrix and say, here's how it would be if Clark was operational again. Here's how it would be with the project that's currently before you. Uh, we didn't do that. Um, we're, not, we're not trying to take any credit for any of the traffic that Clark uh, generated in the past, and we've taken a very modest reduction for their consolidation efforts now. Um, but just to be clear, we've taken no credit for any of the higher volumes that had historically traveled that corridor. Uh, the second thing that Darren touched upon is that we based our numbers on gross fair square footage, not leasable square footage. And it, it, it's very important because on the western side of the campus, which is really the, the primary generator, as it was pointed out, only 60% of that space, approximately, is actually leasable space. So for instance, if, if I'm looking at a, uh, a medical office tenant that's 3,000 square feet, per, for instance, I'm running the generation at 5,000 square feet because I'm, I'm taking into account that non-leasable space, which is very conservative. So the, the generation numbers for the western side could be as high as 50% greater than what they actually will be in the field. But again, um, to be conservative, that's the way we approached it. And then I think the third thing that's important to take into account is, you know, this site is ideally situated. It's, it's within walking distance of the downtown area. It's within walking distance of a number of bus stops um, by the PVTA and others that uh, provide access to employment centers in the region. Uh, we didn't take credit for one trip um, from this project as a, as a transit trip, as a bicycling trip, or as a walking trip. Every trip that we've analyzed for this project, we've assumed is a person arriving and leaving in his car which given the location proximate to downtown and the, again the transit stops we think is, is very conservative and, and certainly will not be what you see in the field. But those were the, the three um, main things that we did to ensure that this analysis uh, really represents what we call a worst case scenario. And by running those numbers what we come up with is that using the city's rates and I we can go through the columns if you want but the, the big number is over here. Um, during the morning peak hour um, the project would generate 130 trips. Um, in the morning, it's predominantly inbound traffic, about 70 in and about 60 out uh, because you have employees coming to work. Uh, during the evening peak hour, again, 130 trips. It, it's basically a, a mirror flip. You have 55 in and, and 75 out uh, because you have more employees leaving. And that's based on the city numbers. Uh, the ITE data uh, had a slightly higher number. Um, during the Morning peak hour, we were showing 161 trips uh, with, again, predominantly inbound, 114 inbound. And then during the evening peak, uh, 179 trips. So we're looking at about you know, two and a half to three trips per minute. Uh, for all analysis purposes, we use the, the ITE data because it was more conservative than the city's own rates. And again, just to, to reiterate, this, this doesn't take any credit for transit. It assumes the, the larger trip generation on the vacant areas, and we're taking no credit for anything Clark had done in the past. Uh, we ran the analyses, and, and as Dar Darren pointed out, in the majority of movements, the impacts are minimal. Um, at the intersection of Prospect with Round Hill, during both the morning and the evening, there's no notable changes to delays or levels of service. That intersection is projected to work under the bill condition, essentially very similar to, as it does in the no-bill condition. Um, at the intersection of Route 9 at Elm Street with Round Hill Road, in the morning, again, there's no reductions to levels of service, some minor increases in delay, but there's no um, notable impact. The only time period and the only movement where there is a reduction is traffic turning 
off of Round Hill Road onto Route 9 in the morning, and it's really, uh, rather in the evening, and it's really that, that left-hand turn movement. Um, and, and I will say that it, our opinion is that the delays that we show in the report are likely overstated for the reasons I indicated before related to trip generation. Uh, and the, basically the last stage of the study is we made some recommendations um, to enhance traffic and, and really it was predominantly what we would call TDM measures, um, transportation demand management. The idea being that we'd like to reduce the number of automobile trips to the extent feasible. Um, the, the two main measures we recommended installation of, of additional bike racks and as, as Darren pointed out there are uh, five new bike racks proposed throughout the campus to facilitate bicycle use by employees as well as residents. Uh, we've also recommended the posting of transit schedules um, in conspicuous places within all the buildings so that all employees and residents are aware of the transit options that are present uh, within the city. And then of course the, the biggest mitigation measure is the, you know, the, the financial contribution um, in excess of $100,000 that would um, be put towards mitigation measures off-site, whether that be a, a bus shelter or flashing lights at existing crosswalks or raised cross crosswalks. I think that's something that will be negotiated with the city, but the financial contribution is there. Uh, and that pretty much sums up what I have. Uh, more than happy to answer any questions the board or audience might have. Um, I know you said you did not include it in your calculations so as to be as conservative as possible, but other than anecdotal, do you have actual numbers about when Clark School was more fully operational and what the traffic actually was like? We, we, we provided with uh, information based on employees, uh, number of employees, number of buses, number of typical deliveries, and I believe the employee number was 104 full-time employees uh, working 8 to 4. Uh, there were, I believe it was 12 buses arriving and departing each day, so a total of 60 for the week. But as far as the dates, the timeline as to when that activity stopped, no, I'm not aware of that. That's one of the reasons we didn't feel it was prudent to take any credit for it. Uh, just a question on the on the parking. The there are a couple spots where it's just restriping. There's existing pavement you're restriping, not introducing new bituminous. Can you just go over again where you, as far as parking is concerned? I know there's the there's the drop off area, sure. uh, by Coolidge, but where you're introducing new paving. Actually, and uh, as a second part, why? Because. You know, you're adding like little bits of little two pot spots here, two spots there, two spots. Why in the when it seems like there's lots of parking? Why those little two 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 spot lit places? All right. So you'd like to see the the restriped areas and also the the new pavement areas, is that right? Yeah. Okay. I'll come back to this one. Um, please let me know if you want to slow down or anything here and go through. The the spots pockets where we put in two spaces here and two spaces here. We basically looked for low hanging fruit. Were there areas we could put in some spaces without really having any impacts? Just easy access, just paving just the spaces. You don't need drive aisles, you know, high return for, for the work, I suppose. So again, just the low-hanging fruit. It's only four spaces like that. Um, and then again, for the restriping, behind Skinner, put three, we gave a lot of space on these, actually. You, you know, we could have, like, squeezed in four. We wanted to make sure we had plenty of access around the spaces and for everyone with parallel parking. And then the area behind Gaywith here, you see this curve? Mm -hmm. It currently has a sort of like notch in the pavement, if you will, that comes out into the grass. Just looking at just, you know, making that a, a smooth radius for a curb line. And right in this notch out area, there's no parking. So by just adjusting this curb line, smoothing it out, we add five spaces right in here. So again, that's just low hanging fruit by just sort of cleaning up the curb line, if you will. Um, you know, these aren't parking spaces per se over here. It's more of a drop-off area next to Coolidge, and we are restriping an area next to Adams for an ADA space. You know, this sidewalks over to Coolidge and Adams. We want to make sure we had enough space, enough ADA to access there. Can I address the drop-off? Oh, sure. Yeah. The drop-off was specifically put in there because we um, are negotiating for Sunnyside uh, is losing their uh, building on the Smith campus and we have agreed to move them over and we felt for safety reasons that we wanted an identified off the road drop off for children. Um, can I ask? Yeah. With that drop off though, if people are coming 
I think that's north towards Coolidge from Round Hill. They go into the drop-off area. Do you expect them to do a U-turn at the bottom of the drop-off area to come back out? How are they going to turn around? Well, right up here is a natural turnaround area. At the, um, right there, so they have to drive through the whole site to get out? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a, not a large site. So just come up here and, and circle around is not too far to go. I think you're getting a lot of people trying to take a U-turn there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe we have to put some signs in to, to prevent that. That's an embankment on that side. If, yeah. if they miss it, yeah, that's they're, true. Gonna, they're gonna be very unhappy. Yeah. We have a grading plan hidden in the back of the slide if you want to look at it. There's some tight contours over there though, mm -hmm. for sure. And the two to the north of Adams, those won't be handicapped? Those are just two spots? <clears throat> just two spaces, yes. And there's one other area we're proposing to add spaces on the, the residential side of things, mm -hmm. which again is just the back-to-back. -back. So eight spaces back-to-back, -to -back, total of 16. Would those back-to-back -back have to each, they would have to be associated with the same unit? I would think so, yes. Yeah. That's required by zoning. You can only do back to back. If they're, it's it's they're, they're going to be numbered right. for the same unit, so right. it's not going to be parked wherever you want. They're right. going to have to be numbered right. such that they're associated. <coughs> Could I ask another one? Yeah. Um, so I, I think a couple times you said 38 units in Hubbard and Rogers, but the original proposal had 42. Right. I can so. explain that. Uh, Mass Historic and National Park Service came back, <coughs> and there are elements within Hubbard that they want us to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, so the number after the requested submission came down a bit. Um, we have to preserve the um, what is known in in, um, in Hubbard as the uh, chapel. So the chapel has to stay in place. We are also required. This may sound strange to some people, but we have to reuse the the uh, the length of the historic chalkboards within. For the built into the walls. Correct. Yeah. Um, so when we did a recalculation, and I, I think we've, we've site measured that thing maybe three times, uh, I think it has the potential to maybe go lower and maybe one unit will get split into two, but originally we had always worked on 42, but 38 seemed to be the safe number. Yeah, I'd just add one more note again to the parking. Um, I know if this was a brand new site, this isn't the type of parking you necessarily see. This again comes back to the preservation of the site, how we're you know, doing these back-to-back -back spaces and uh, you know just the slight adjustments. Mm -hmm. You know, again, we're not looking to impact this green space <coughs> at all significantly. So we really try to just what could we do here to gain a little bit of parking that's going to be reasonable, and not have a heavy impact on the site. Our Ulta survey of the vegetation uh, identified uh, 1,200. Uh, piece of vegetation, and I believe Dan, we only found one of those to be in danger. There was one that an arborist had pegged as being unhealthy, and with our development, we're not looking to. Uh, we're not we're not tearing any trees down. And in fact, in concert with the National Park Service and and Mass Historic, um, those plaques that you see on those trees have to all remain as do benches, um, sidewalk plaques. All of those features that are historic must remain on the property. If I can ask, I, I've got a kind of related between parking and traffic, but I'll just make sure I'm understanding. So sure. <clears throat> on traffic, or I guess on, on as you looked at the parking, gross, without the adjustments, without the historic stuff, would have been approximately 300 spaces. I believe that's right, yes. Then with the adjustment based upon actual usable square footage, 63%, that comes down. Yes. And then that's where you've tried to work in and end up with that many spaces. Right, but it's still a reduction beyond. A reduction yes. but versus the gross amount. But on the traffic side, you did. it seems like you did kind of the opposite. You went the other way and said, we're not going to take credit for anything, and we're going to maximize the trips so that we're going to get the highest level, or in your sense, the most conservative measure on the traffic side. Is that, it's, I'm just trying to understand, yeah, one seems to be coming down and one seems, right. you seem to be taking 
a reduction on one side, but then an increase on the other. I'm just trying to sure I understand sure. that, oh, yeah. that dynamic. Let me explain a little. Okay. <laughs> it's very, it's complicated, you know, um, for a site where we're not doing that much site work. There's a lot of complexity to this, to, to this historic preservation effort. And uh, this is one of the central themes of those complexities. Um, on the parking, yes, we're taking those reductions. The numbers we end up with, up with, I believe, are still very conservative. For the amount of square footage that is going to be developed? <laughs> yes. Okay. For the trip generation, um, we're talking about the level of service, the analysis on the roadways. Those are the ones that are all bumped up. Those are the ones full gross square footage. You know, you're not taking reductions for the, uh, the Clark School historic operations or anything like that. Okay. Now, that's when you do your traffic analysis. When you do your, your trip generation calculations based on the zoning ordinance, there's a chart in there which you know, says you know, two spaces per residential unit, unless it's under 750, then it's one. And you know, for each use, there's a different factor. For those ones, we did take a reduction based on the, the leasable area. But, and, and that's, that ends up like, you know, kind of working its way through in a different way. But is, is that clear? I know it's a complicated issue. Okay. So is that no, I just want to make sure of the kind of the relation between the two. And sure, okay. yeah. Also, let me just add to that that um, with the traffic mitigation, um, there, what's in the request is that there is a reduction of mitigation required because the mitigation is required to be done based on gross square gross area not leasable um, so the planning board does have the authorization to you know modify mitigation requirements based on valid information that's presented to say you know well this scenario that we're presenting is different from what a standard you know application might be so they have requested on the monetary mitigation amount a reduction based on the fact that their leasable area is not comparable to what a standard typical new build out new construction gross versus leasable would be so, so on the parking side everything's scaled to that usable quote unquote space number both on mitigation right. and on number of spaces right okay okay steven um, the three buildings in the back, the boiler room, the engineering uh, house, and the maintenance garage, you're not going to do, you're not going to be leasing those, they're going to stay for your use as a... Yeah, the engineer's house, I, I think it's, it's called the cottage, and that's what it is. We really, you know, we really are going to leave it just like it is. There's just nothing. it'll be empty, or...? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think it's part of the, we still are going to maintain staff on site. Mm -hmm. um, so we still believe it's going to continue to be the engineer's house. Yeah. Uh, and it's um, because we, we have some pretty complicated systems there. Um, and we need to keep that full-time person on site. I, our, our, our management on site is going to be very similar to the campus management that's on site now for the Clark School. Mm -hmm. it, the campus still had those had nothing's changed on what needs to happen to Right, so the boiler room will still supply the It'll be the boiler room. room. Yeah. Now and that other shed is, is really an oversized cinder block uh, garage yeah. mm -hmm. that I, I would love to bulldoze down because I don't think it's aesthetically pleasing, but I can't. Right. I, I based on the fact that it's there, it's part of the campus, it has to stay. So I may try to pretty it up a little bit, but other than that, it has to stay. But well, not, not because of it as an individual building, but because it's part of the scheme. Correct. Okay. Right. Now, if you guys ever did, or Carolyn, if they ever did decide that they want to do something with the maintenance garage or change the use of the engineering house, do they have to come back to us at that point? Um, well, if there's a change in the use of the building, so what you're approving is the mix of uses that's presented in this application. So yes, if it went to, instead of being a residence for, you know, maintenance person, it went to an office, then yes, it would have, They'd to, have to come back to us. So we would see any change in use. Yeah. Yep. As I understand, for every tenant we have, we would have to apply for a zoning permit, which would then start the adds and deducts to the parking tabulation and square footage. So it would go in concert with that. Right. So, well, um, right. The only the difference would be, say, you approve the twenty percent um, higher intensity office type uses, so medical office, and a building, um, and it's slated for each building. There's basically a calculation for twenty percent, and one of the one or two or more of the buildings don't 
utilize that 20%. They don't have to come back for that. And that's the thing we would look at at a building permit level is, um, you know, the 20% is the maximum, sort of the, the, wor the worst case scenario. But by approving the worst case scenario, they can always do less. So under that scenario, you wouldn't have to see a change. But if it were a change that sort of is a total change in use or an increase intensity, that's what would trigger a reevaluation. And that 20% calculation is done per building or for the whole site? The way the zoning is written is that is it's on a building by building basis. So it doesn't allow the flexibility to say it's on a site square footage. Right. So the maintenance garage, the engineer's house, the boiler room have no effect or or the gymnasium in that twenty percent. So it's twenty percent of the, the of coolage or twenty percent yes. of atoms. Right. Yes. Those two buildings to answer your question directly, um, the boiler house is mostly subterranean. There really is no commercial use for it. it. It couldn't be zoned for anything. Right. Maybe to house livestock on, in a storm. That's about it. Uh, the the cottage would probably be the only one that could have something else, but it's just so small. Dan, what's the square footage of the cottage? Oh, I really don't know. It's, I have it over here. Bill, do you know? Yeah. No. It's, uh, I don't think you're gonna find that. I, no, I think oh, it's, I, I don't, everything else in there. I'm not sure we even. I'm not even sure we've. I, I gotta be it's honest with you. Thousand. Now that you bring it in, it's a little over a thousand. I've never been in it. It's under a thousand. It's under a thousand. It's cute house. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's about twenty by thirty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a bunch of some other technical questions. Do you want to let the public speak or, or or any other? I mean, I got. Does anybody else have any? Uh, Most of them like little just have a yeah, clarification. Just. One, you mentioned during your traffic study that you did the traffic study in the afternoon from two to six or four to six. And I'll just mention that Northampton High School is about a mile down the road on Elm Street that lets out at two. So we might want to just think about the impact from two to six instead of four to six. Just because a lot of traffic begins really at two o'clock, Smith students, afternoon classes, but also, you know, Northampton High gets out at two o'clock. So and it's just, you know, a stone's throw down the road. So just food for thought, but and then um, the only I just had a question. And I don't know if this is a semantic thing. In your conclusion, it says in summary, you know, majority of instances in addition to project related attack at traffic is not anticipated to significantly impact traffic operations within the study area over no build conditions. And it's just the use of the word significantly. Is that a is that a technical term in this particular type of presentation? Because as a resident, and I don't live in that particular area, but I have been there and I've driven around and I go by there all the time. Sure. Almost one more car at times would seem to be a significant impact. So I'm just trying to clarify: is that? Well, what we, what we typically look at is does it result in reductions of, to levels of service? Does it does it increase your delays by? I mean, if you're increasing a del your delay by two seconds, so instead of waiting 14 seconds to 16 seconds, I wouldn't consider that significant. Okay. But if you were waiting another, you know, 30 seconds, then it's something that would the average motorist would notice on a daily basis. So that's the, that's the what I would say is the criteria. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, but I've got a question on that. I mean, you are sure. projecting that the level of service go to F for, you know, the. Uh, Southbound turned on the Elm Street. Right, and and that's and that's why we said noted that in the majority of instances, and again the um, the reduction of the, the increase in delay and the reduction of level of service on that movement is based almost ex almost exclusively due to the fact that we're overstating the number of employees that are going to be leaving there in the evening. I think when when this space is leased, the reality is you're going to have less employees than we projected because that dead space isn't going to have employees in it. Uh, hallways, stairwells, you know. There are, there's a lot of square footage that we've generated for that simply won't have anyone working there. And then I did, and we also believe that people will be taking the, the bus, people will be walking if they are in the downtown area. Yeah. Um, well, and I mean, just for clarification, I mean, to, for the public to hear, if if in in the traffic plan, the traffic analysis, if you didn't do anything, it was that turn was going to go to a D. So correct. Um, but it but that is it, it's an effect. All right. Yep. My name is Dan Dodge with Open Real Estate. I just wanted to uh, uh, clarify what Aaron had spoken about. Um, the granite curbing that we will be adding on both the east and the west side of Brown Hill Road across our frontage, um, that's going to be part of our on-site development work. Um, we're also going to be working, as Darren had mentioned, the um, 
no parking on both sides of Round Hill Road. We'll do whatever permitting is required as part of uh, DPW to get that approved, and we'll do all the proper signage for no parking, um, no drop-offs, no delivery, stuff like that. Because on, on ours, we believe we have ample room to pull in the back off the road, so across the front, we can pull up in the front, um, as well as the uh, raised crosswalks and enhancing those at the proper locations across uh, east and west, across the uh, Round Hill Road. I think the goal is to, number one, uh, the street is loaded with Smith's College student parking. That's got to all go away. Speed bumps have to go in, so we've got to slow the traffic down. And one of the major concerns with the neighborhood was that uh, snow removal was very difficult here in the wintertime. Um, and part of the reason is that there are not presently granite curbs so that the plows can't are not going up against the, the, the curb to clear. That's one thing that the city brought to our attention. If by no longer having parking on both sides, they can now essentially get tighter to the curb and with the asphalt curb they'd be peeling them back and they would be at the edge of our sidewalk. So we will be doing enhancements with uh, granite curbing on both sides. Any additional sidewalk? No. Any other questions by the board? I have one of Carolyn. Yeah. Um, is the no parking, I mean, is that something that is under their control? I, I'm just. No, I mean, you I mean, that's wait. That would have to be granted by the city. Oh, right. So you could, as a permit condition, say that the applicant shall um, petition the city council to, um, to remove the allowance for on street parking and then pay for the new signs to indicate there's no on street parking. happy to do and we would like that request. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to go right after you. <laughs> I did speak with the DPW today, David Valletta. He said they, that they would do it. I, I understand. I, I don't know if the DPW would prefer they do it, but I just wanted to mention it. Okay. So. Okay, open up to the public. I guess. Before we do, uh, can I see just a quick show of hands of who, uh, who's interested uh, in speaking tonight from the public, just so I can get a feel for, okay, there's several of you. Uh, it is 10 o'clock, and despite our best efforts uh, to move things along, it, it's 10 o'clock. So what we're going to do is uh, everybody's going to have their say. I'll call on, on one of you at a time. No, um, no second turns until everybody's had, a, had their chance. If you feel very strongly or you're in agreement with the person who speaks ahead of you in the essence of time. Um, if you want to get your name on record and say, I, I, uh, I want to restate what Mr. Smith in front of me just said without restating the five minute speech that Mr. Smith said, that would be appreciated um, just to keep moving things along. Address everything to the board, please. If you have questions of the developer, ask questions of the board. This is a give and take uh, type of thing. Um, but don't direct any questions uh, to the applicant. And let's see how this goes. So first up, if I could see a show of hands. Yes, in the back. If you can come up, state your name, please. Hi. I'm Sarah Metcalf, sure, yeah. and thank you for calling on me, because I actually have um, some opinions from a group of people to present. And I have uh, at the suggestion of thank Paul Spector made copies of our points for you. Um, we have been very interested in the whole matter of the development of the Clark campus um, and have had lots of neighborhood meetings about it and lots of conversations on our listserv. Um, and uh, we, first of all, want to say how happy we are that the historic uh, preservation is so important to, uh, to Opal and we're very grateful to Clark for taking it into consideration uh, when they when they decided on a developer and um, the preservation of the green space and uh, the trees, great, really really happy about that, um, and uh, kind of consonant with that, uh, as we read through all these plans, um, the group of us that met recently and uh, that was about 15 people that talked to Paul Spector and and. Uh, and then I wrote up kind of the consensus uh, positions that we arrived at at that meeting and invited members of our listserv to weigh in. So 
ultimately I have about 25 people who explicitly agreed with these points. Um, <clears throat> so the first one is uh, we, we support the request for the reduction in required parking. Um, because, as we see it, it will mean the greater likelihood of preserving the beauty of the campus, which is a strong, strong neighborhood interest. Um, and then a lot of what our other concerns had to do with is um, the increased anticipated traffic on Round Hill Road and ways perhaps to mitigate against that. Um, I think there was a pretty strong majority of people that, well, I mean, certainly at these 25 people for whom I'm speaking at the moment agreed that, that it makes sense to eliminate parking on Round Hill Road because any time there's a parked vehicle to a traffic past it is not possible and vehicles have to yield to one another and, and uh, if you're trying to come down the hill and somebody's trying to come up, you know, it's, it's at currently, you know, a matter of kind of luck and maneuvering to find a place to pull over so the other person can get by and with a bunch of people trying to get in and out i just don't see that 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 would work anymore um that did raise a question in the minds of people who live on round hill road whether um there might be any places available to residents um to use on the clark campus during non-working hours you know if you had evening guests you know, would they would there be empty parking lots uh, on the Clark campus that we might be able to use. Um, we're also uh, uh, pleased by the suggestion of the raised crosswalks and possibly even additional speed bumps if the raised crosswalks aren't, aren't you know, close or numerous enough to really significantly slow traffic. Because if you eliminate all that on-street parking on Round Hill Road, and create a, a through corridor from Elm Street to Prospect, it's, it's not a place where you want people going quickly. Not only do many pedestrians walk alongside and cross and all that kind of thing, but uh, it's also a, you know, a hill with a curve. And as you get up to the top, you can't see people coming from the opposite direction. And uh, so anything that can be done to slow things down, we would support. And hopefully, uh, whatever raised stuff might go in the street would also um, be friendly to bicyclists. Um, some some people have mentioned that if you have a bunch of bumps, then then cycling becomes uh, more difficult. So anyway, engineers can can think about that. But we we're interested in uh, traffic calming measures. Um, we also are very interested in supporting uh, bicycle and pedestrian traffic and public transportation on and off Round Hill because, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in reducing the volume of traffic. And, and so I don't know if the people from uh, Opal were here when I was speaking about the uh, pedestrian footpath that used to go behind uh, Bell Hall that was part of Clark's, you know, Clark, Clark's um, sidewalks that many people in our neighborhood currently use as a as a shortcut um, off Round Hill down to Henshaw, and uh, if 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 a sidewalk like that is not going to get constructed on the Bell Hall lot, maybe Opal would be willing to consider constructing one along the border of that property line for the use of people who would be living in in uh, Rogers and. Uh, I'm blanking on the other building, but the, the ones on the east side of, of Round Hill Road. Because if you're if you're looking to, you know, um, have people that um, might be able to get by with one fewer car, for instance, um, it seems to me great idea to have a really good sidewalk down there. Um, then. Uh, we we also a number of neighbors uh, said that they currently enjoy walking through the Clark campus that they enter it not not necessarily through paved paths um, that it that it is a sort of pedestrian route that that uh, again kind of uh, encourages people to get around and do errands and so forth without the use of cars and we were hoping that those might remain open and available for public use and not get fenced and, and not be posted with no trespassing signs. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, the, the dangerousness of the intersections uh, at, at both ends of Round Hill Road are not only represented in, in uh, traffic accident figures, 
Um, I think anecdotally, probably all of us who live on the Hill have have spun around about 180 degrees a couple of times if we've, as we've approached those intersections in the winter time. The hill's pretty steep, and, and through the best efforts of the DPW doesn't seem to mean that it's it you know it's not slippery there. There's a spring at the top of Round Hill Road. It kind of continually re-ices the road in the winter time. Um, so we're very concerned about that with uh, a lot of increased traffic, and we would hope that that you know maybe if there's if there's more funding available uh, through traffic mitigation fees for mobile that that maybe the the safety of those roads could be better addressed in the winter time and as well as the visibility when you're on Round Hill trying to turn either direction onto Elm Street there are parking spaces now that come so close to that intersection that in order to see around them and see whether there's oncoming traffic you have to kind of pull out halfway into the road it's it's really not a very a very well engineered intersection as it stands even in good in good weather so uh, but this this you know the difficulty of getting off the hill when when it has snowed is is a very real one so those are my points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could ask to you use your slide of the of the green campus. Is that would that be all right? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, while we're doing that, I want to make your name again. Uh, Richard Green, 88 Round Hill Road. That's G R E N E. Um, I, I'm, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased uh, that uh, Obel is determined to try and preserve the, the character of the campus, preserve trees and green space. Um, I did have a suggestion. Uh, the powerhouse sculpture studio. Anyway. To get to get to the, the main points, um, I, I do have to ask a question. My understanding is that the daily traffic load, uh, the latest one, there were three different uh, versions of the traffic study, uh, was 1,659 cars a day, adding 471 to whatever the uh, additional figure was. 471 being the existing figure. Is that correct? Because uh, there's a figure going around of 1299, which I think is additional, an earlier version of the additional. The daily number we based on the ITE data was 1318. Pardon me? 1318. Okay, that's the total, or is that the additional? That's the additional. More that's the additional. So you add 471 to that. Okay. This has been kind of a moving target. There have been three revisions of the, of the uh, traffic plan, and uh, we've tried to follow it, but we're just uh, ordinary citizens. We're not traffic experts. Um, I haven't run the figures on that particular one. I thought I ran the last one, but if you divide 47, 471 into that, you get figures from the versions of the traffic uh, plan that I've uh, looked at, traffic study, of an increase of 352 to 375%. And I'll wager that the figures are low, because I've been in a situation in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, there was a big development near the, uh, uh, near the physics lab that uh, involved a contest between the community and the university. Each side had a traffic consultant. The figures were strikingly different. The ones uh, produced by the university were very favorable to their the level of development they were proposing. The ones produced by the other traffic uh, expert were much lower, more favorable, pardon me, higher, more favorable to the community. Um, we've seen these figures go down and down with each revision. It, some One of them did go up in one revision, but particularly the uh, peak hour traffic, which I guess impacts on the mitigation <coughs> fee, has gone down and down. Uh, I'd like to ask you, so I'll imagine, you, you mentioned something about riding the street. You live on the street now, so let's say there's 60 cars an hour. We're talking about a over 350% uh, increase. That could go up to 226. 
minutes. In other words, one car a minute, four cars a minute. Um, it could also easily go up to 250 or even higher, I would, I would strongly imagine. There are two, that's the general traffic load. That's one problem. There are two other problems. One, the Round Hill Road, Elm Street intersection. It's called the Round, Street, Round Hill Road, Elm Street intersection. It's really Round Hill Road, Elm Street, Campus Lane. Campus Lane, we don't have a picture. It's the main em uh, entrance and exit from, from the college. Cars turn left out of there. Cars turn left from Elm into there. Uh, it's not heavy traffic, but it's a pretty continuous stream. We also have two student crosswalks there that are heavily used at certain times of the day. Uh, this is a very complex inter intersection. If you add, at present, it works fairly well, except for left turns uh, from Round Hill onto Elm. I think everything is going to work considerably less well if you increase the traffic on an order of 350, 400 uh, percent. Uh, that needs to be looked at, I think. A second, well, on the, on the other end, on prospect end, the ice has been mentioned. There's a very steep hill. Visibility has been mentioned. That's not a great intersection either. You add traffic to that, there are going to be problems. And I'll, and I'll second what Sarah Metcalf said. Uh, I, I go down that hill in the winter five miles an hour. I've stopped using it because one day there was ice. These springs, there are a couple of them cause ice to form very quickly. Uh, five miles an hour, I slid out into the intersection. I couldn't stop myself. Uh, Paul Spector, our councilman, had the same experience. A lot of us have had that experience. So these are, these are tough intersections. Another problem is you're going to have the addition of parents taking uh, students to the their children to Sunnyside, the daycare center. Um, a lot of them are going to come from the west. There's a big residential area between Round Hill Road and, and Childs, Childs Park and off to the south of Elm. Uh, those people are going to be coming east to take their children uh, to school. Some of them will walk. Some of them will drive, be driving their kids on the way to work. Uh, some will never walk. Uh, some won't walk because it's raining or it's snowing. There's going to be a considerable influx of traffic in there. I'm not questioning the figures. I haven't even looked at them, actually, uh, for that. But here's the problem. They're coming from the west. They're going down Elm Street. They're going to have a tremendous problem turning left at Elm during peak hours. It's already difficult. Uh, they're not going to want to go to Prospect because of the problems at the base of, of this very steep San Francisco steep hill that we've got on the north side of uh, Round Hill. They're particularly not going to want to go back down that way where it's very dangerous when there's ice there. And there's a visibility problem, particularly when you're turning left. You can't see the traffic coming up Prospect toward you for, on your right until you're out into the intersection. And you, I've never been unlucky with that, but if you increase traffic enough, there'll be some accidents there. Um, as I think there will be at the Elm Street intersection, unless they put in, even if they put in a, a, a three, four, five phase light, because you're going to have a lot of people getting frustrated, trying to turn left, trying to get out into the stream of traffic, students crossing, cars having to stop for the students. There'll be fender benders, road rage, people will be injured, I think, pedestrians. Um, the third possibility for the daycare center is they can go up um, Bancroft, which is the, the curving road, I think, in the upper right-hand corner of the map. Uh, people already do that. My wife and myself and other people uh, use Bancroft to avoid the congestion, current congestion at Elm and uh, Round Hill Road. We use it going when we're going to Florence, when we're going to the hospital. Um, when we're going well, doctor's offices, a lot of doctor's offices in Florence and, be, and near the hospital. People are going to use that more and more if the traffic on Route Hill Road increases by 350, 400 percent. Uh, 400% is my figure. 350 is kind of in the middle. Well, it's below the middle. It's, it's, it's lower than the lowest uh, figure from the traffic studies. 
Um, there's a problem at the top of Round Hill, of, of, pardon me, of Bancroft. Uh, there's a traffic choke point there. There are cars, it's, there's parking on both sides. The street is about the width, I would say, I didn't measure it, of Round Hill, about 20 feet. It's a street, you can tell by looking at it, that it'd be hard for, for two cars to uh, pass in going, going in different directions where there are cars parked. And there are always cars parked in the last couple hundred yards or so. Uh, there's, so when, when you put all these three problems together, one thing that seems to me to be extremely desirable, certainly desirable from the point of view of re residents, I don't want to see my traffic increase by 350% or more in front of my house. We bought our house, our condo at 88 Round Hill three, three and a half years ago. It was a very quiet neighborhood then. I don't know when the heavy traffic was at Clark, but it certainly wasn't in our time. Uh, it's going to change radically uh, with this development. So the question is, what, if anything, can be done to reduce the traffic? Um, I have uh, three suggestions. One is what I call a back road. People call it different things, which would be a link. Um, there's currently a road from the powerhouse. If you look in the, at that uh, building that points upward in the upper left uh, part of the campus, that's the powerhouse. I can't see it too well from here, but there's a road that goes down there to lower Bancroft. It comes in just above, above Crescent. Uh, that road does not link, link to the center of the campus. There, it could be, there could be a link from the parking area to that road between the engineer's cottage and the garage, which incidentally I'd also like to see torn down if that can be done. Really doesn't add anything, and it would be create a place for additional parking spaces, which I think will be needed uh, without, uh, without diminishing the beauty of the front of the campus. I, by the way, I'm sorry to take so long, but it's, it's a very complicated problem, as I think you can appreciate. It is settled. We can't do anything about that garage. Yeah. So. Well, uh, that's just a passing thought. I haven't even focused if, on it. If we could focus, you're at the, about the 15-minute mark, and for the sake of others, I'd just like to. I want to hear what you have to say, but if we could. I'll, I'll try and speed it up. Thank you. Um, OK. One objection to that is that the slope is too steep. It isn't in that point that I've mentioned. It's steep everywhere else there. I would say it's probably about a five-degree grade. I'm not an expert on this. I don't know. There's approximately a 45. 50-yard stretch between the parking area and the existing road. Uh, that would take traffic off Round Hill Road. It would relieve the problems at both end, ends of Round Hill Road, which are going to be major. Uh, and it would uh, also, incidentally, relieve Upper um, Bancroft, near Ro Round Hill Road, of the traffic that's going to go there when people are having problems getting in at, uh, at the ends of Round Hill Road, uh, when more, oh, a considerable number, greater number of people are using that. Uh, the big objection to that obviously comes from people who live on Crescent and Franklin, which would be the streets they would use to get back to Elm, uh, and of course the people who live on uh, Lower Bancroft. Uh, there's been talk about what, what people are calling containment, meaning keep the traffic on Round Hill Road. I think this is a matter of fairness. Does Round Hill Road get all the traffic, or is it shared? At present, uh, the buildup will cause, will bring traffic, uh, I think, of 1,659 cars daily to Round Hill Road. The traffic on Franklin, I don't know what it is on Crescent, uh, this was 2007. You gave us the figures, Carolyn. Uh, it was 1,141. So there's a lot of room there for distributing this rather than putting it on, all on Round Hill Road. That's of interest to us as people who live there. I think it's also of interest to the city in terms of preventing serious problems at uh, Elm and Prospect and Elm and Round Hill. A final thing. Uh, well, there's a similar possibility on the other side going down to Henshaw. I don't want to get into that. It'll just take too much time. You, you can figure that one out and embrace it or reject it. Um, 
The uh, another possibility to the uh, back road, if the, that's not approved, would be to eliminate parking on Upper Bancroft. That wouldn't do anything much for Round Hill Road, but it would relieve the pressure at the uh, intersections. Um, next point, and I've got three more, two of which are quite short. The next point is the how the 20 percent buildup of high traffic offices is measured. We asked OPD about it. We're told at first that it, it's based on the usable uh, space, and that was corrected, and we were told it was based on the total space, gross square footage rather than the usable space. So there, there's kind of a double incentive here. I assume when this ordinance was passed a few months ago, allowing the 20 percent high traffic development, uh, that the reason for it was to give uh, developers an incentive to buy church and historic <coughs> educational properties. Uh, what's happened here, I suspect without anybody having realized it, the, the law of unforeseen consequences, is that in Opal's case, they're getting a 30 percent incentive. That's the percentage that uh, 20 percent of the gross would represent of the usable space. They can use they can use 30 percent of the usable space for high traffic offices, more traffic on the road, more problems at the end. Uh, unless the, there's something that makes it crystal clear in the history of the ordinance. Mr. Uh, Green, I don't want to interrupt, but you're at, you're at 20 minutes now. It's 10.30, so I, I really need you to, to try to two, wrap it okay, up. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. That's all I need to say on that subject. Uh, okay. The other thing is, if there's no parking on Round Hill Road, we need speed bumps. We need right. And that was proposed. Right. Yeah, pardon me for repeating. Um, I'm also concerned that there isn't going to be enough parking and that uh, a few years, two years from now or whenever, you'll be asked to uh, issue a new permit for more parking on campus, especially if parking is eliminated at Round Hill Road, which I'm not opposing. Finally, I just want to mention very quickly that uh, the community has been handicapped here. The, we found out about the application a few days after it was filed. We weren't informed. We, we heard the rumor and we asked, has it been filed? Uh, we then spent the weekend trying to access the documents. It's tremendously difficult. I don't know if you ever tried to access documents on the uh, OPD site. If you don't know where you're going, you're lost. Uh, and then there's this flow of amendments. The last uh, revision of the, of the traffic uh, study was I think the, the fifth, that's six days ago, uh, there was a revision of the whole application and the associated papers. Some papers disappeared, new ones appeared. On the third, this doesn't seem to me to be the way to do it. I'm told that there should be 30 days between the application and the hearing so as to give the developer a fair shake so that they're not delayed. Uh, I think it should be 30 days from the last amendment where the amendment is as significant as these have been. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Catherine Grandonico from Bancroft Road. Um, I will be brief. I am one of those people where the, um, if there is an entrance and exit onto Lower Bancroft, that will directly affect us, so I'm hoping that that doesn't go through. But the one thing that hadn't been addressed is the drainage and runoff on the westerly side of the campus, which currently um, is quite a problem for both me and the neighbors that are all downhill from me as the water comes streaming off of the campus across the road over my yard down into their yards. Um, so I know that there's going to be granite curbing on the Round Hill Road, but I didn't know if curbing could be addressed where there's holes on Bancroft as well as there's storm drains now, and um, they have um, boulders around. I didn't know if perhaps more of those could be put around the storm drains so that they could at least displace the water so that it wasn't shooting out like a jet from there's basically two areas um, onto Round Hill or onto Bancroft. Also, um, I appreciate that you're keeping the trees, but I, and I know that one had been trimmed this summer. Um, but right on the corner of uh, Bancroft there, there are quite a few tree limbs that look like they could go in any storm if we were to have any specifically in October. So I didn't know if it could be noted that upkeep of the tree limbs would be appreciated on that side. Um, and that's all. 
keep it brief. Okay. Thank you. It's all, yes. it's all good. I'll try to set a speed record. <coughs> I'm Tom Durr, 32 B Round Hill Road. I'm speaking I'm sorry, for your name again? Tom Durr, D E R R. I'm speaking uh, also at the request of my neighbor, Deborah Eaton, at 32A, who is unable to be here tonight. And she asked me to represent her interests, which are, uh, like mine, strongly favorable to Opal's development plan, including the parking reduction. And the only thing that really uh, she's worried about, of course, is the usual one the traffic flow. In believing that Round Hill Road is too narrow a road to bear a very much increase in traffic, and certainly uh, if the parking is allowed on it, it's already restricted on much of the road anyway. It should be restricted, uh, disallowed on all of it. The other point that she wanted to introduce, and I'll introduce it only for her, and I'm open on the subject, is that given the increase in traffic on the top of the hill, she believes that one ought to look seriously at two means of egress, east and west, one to Lower Bancroft and one to Henshaw, and she hopes that that might be considered. Thank you. Thank you. This be required. Fire Anybody else? Yes, sir. First, uh, I don't agree with all the neighbors with eliminating parking on Round Hill because I don't know where any of our friends, guests, or anybody would park because I'm not sure that that's going to resolve the problem. Cars still need to park. And people don't have long enough driveways on Round Hill Road to accommodate parking, let alone our own personal deliveries or anything else that, that we have to deal with. So, uh, you know, I don't think that's a solution. I think that's just a, hey, you know, it makes the road a little wider. But 20 feet isn't exactly great for a lot of cars and increased traffic. Um, I couldn't agree more with uh, creating egresses on Bancroft and on Henshaw. I know it's not popular to say if you don't if you live on those streets. But I agree with, uh, with the agreement. Why should Round Hill Road take the full brunt of all the traffic? It just doesn't seem fair. And it's not practical. And that intersection on Elm Street, even if you have three cars increased, if you're taking a left-hand turn, it could take 20 minutes. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when there's 30 cars at rush hour. And it just it really doesn't make any sense that that's not going to be an issue. I think you're going to need to put a traffic light there. And I think the fact that you have pedestrians, so even in the, in the, in the three-second shot you get to take a left-hand turn, without a doubt, there's always a pedestrian in, in the crosswalk. So you can't take a left-hand turn. And I'm going to guess, because I think you know, a lot of the forecasts are just guesses, that 90% of the people are going to be taking a left-hand turn, because they're probably coming from a commute, especially if uh, I, I still can't even figure out the percents of what percent is going to become commercial. But nobody has really addressed the commercial piece. All the traffic indications are at peak, morning, and evening. Well, if you have a very successful medical office, are people not going to come and go continuously? I don't know, you know, people go to regular doctors and dental offices, but if you have a busy doctor or dental office, you could have 25 to 30 people in one hour visiting that office. And I don't see where that's spoken to at all in any of these reports or studies. So I think that's something that needs to be considered. Um, and you know, I just feel that overall, I'm not sure where the commercial side came in. But originally, it was all supposed to be residential. Now that it's going to be commercial, I feel like Northampton has so many other areas where there could really be, and it already is zoned commercial. And now, all of a sudden, Round Hill is going to become a major commercial hub before it was a school. And I'd point out that when the numbers for Clark School were indicated, I'm going to guess, just like I think all these projections are guesses, that um, there were not as many residents on Round Hill Road at that time. There's been several condos that have been added. There's been other houses that have been built. So we can't ignore the fact that there's a lot more residents on Round Hill now than there were 20, 30, or 40 years ago. And I'm here just to preserve. It, it's a fact that my quality of life is going to go down. And it's unfortunate, but it's just a fact, and I have to accept it. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to mitigate the reduction of our quality of life on Round Hill Road. It's a great, quaint neighborhood. It's got a lot of people that are there because of the quality of life. And it's definitely going to be diminished. So I would just urge this board to figure out ways to reduce that diminished lifestyle, because it's going to happen. 
And I think that we're kidding ourselves if, the, if we underestimate the traffic impact on Roundsville Road. And I can't believe nobody has said how appalling the potholes on Round Hill Road are. So I can't believe that it's not even a stipulation that Round Hill Road has to be paved somehow to accommodate these additional thousand cars. Because, you know, just living there, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I cheer when I see the pothole filled only to be destroyed again next winter. Um, and again, that, that left hand turn on Prospect Street, I think it's been underestimated just how ridiculously dangerous that traffic street is. So, I, you know, anyone that's ever lived there, I mean, you had mentioned that you've been on Round Hill and you know it's a real bear taking that left hand turn on Elm Street. Well, just magnify that times however many it's going to be. And, uh, you know, I don't know if this is a done deal as far as the commercial side and the entire west side being commercial buildings, but it just seems like that's going to increase traffic even more than projections, regardless of the net space or the gross space or any of the other figures. And my other concern is, what happens if they're wrong about everything and that they can't actually do anything? They, there's not the demand for the commercial space or the demand for the residential space. Then what? We will have made all these changes to Round Hill Road that are for the worse, but we're the ones that are still stuck living there with um, buildings that have been built out that now have the city has to figure out how to create revenue, and so does Opal. And you know, I don't know what the answer is, but it just seems like we're about to make some big changes with traffic and everything else. And if we're wrong, then we're stuck in a neighborhood with devalued houses and uh, reduced quality of living. So, you know, again, I, I think the biggest way to accommodate the traffic is making sure that there's some kind of uh, flow on Bancroft and on Henshaw, because there's the space. And I also think that having a direct route to King Street makes sense. And the quickest route is up King Street. But again, I know that's not popular, but I just don't think Round Hill should take the full brunt of all of this increased traffic. I just don't think it's feasible. Even if we agreed to it, I just it's very hard to imagine that there's very little or, quote, no significant impact. Five cars taking a left-hand turn on to, on to Elm Street is a significant increase in the amount of time that it's going to take to take that left-hand turn. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I wish I knew beforehand that you were going to say this because it's uh, large that I'm going to add to. Ma'am, can I get your um, name? Pardon me? Your name. your name, please. Hetty Rose, Round Hill Road. Um, and I do want to applaud wherever they were, all the Opal people, because I do think they've done a lot to uh, uh, meet some of the needs of uh, all of us, including the city at large, which is to concentrate on maintaining the historic nature and not to take down trees and to respect green spaces and so forth. So we're all very grateful for that. Um, I do want to reiterate something else about the traffic problem, and that is that in many of the OPAL documents, they seem to refer to this as being a downtown location. And I think uh, all of us in Northampton realize that that is not downtown. Um, I'm also very puzzled about the 20% issue and suspect that that must have come up initially maybe when uh, Hawley Junior High was being developed, which is in the center of downtown. Uh, in any case, it isn't, it isn't the kind of thing that will either contribute, I think, to the feasibility of what is being talked about and it certainly doesn't do anything for the traffic problems, which are legion in that area. Um, I don't really want to go through that because I think my predecessor said it all. Um, I think it is an issue for all of us on Round Hill right now. Um, I might add, and I don't know whether that was taken into uh, the traffic study, uh, there is already a uh, a major condominium size, which is actually across from me. Uh, there are three more condominiums that have been added. So when we're talking about Clark School had a lot of traffic when they had uh, a lot more uh, uh, students there, uh, that doesn't do away with, with the fact that we have a lot more actual residents with cars and people who need to get out to do uh, what we all need to do. 
Um, in addition to that, I would like to point out that the whole area is indeed residential, except for the educational institutions around. Um, many of us who are now in the area are people who've lived in Northampton for a long time or else have come in because we've liked that particular area. So we came in after the Clark School uh, buses and so forth. Uh, we bought into something because we wanted it, we cared for it, and we continue to care for it, even with the many problems that have been talked about, uh, the ice, the potholes, the traffic, etc. I don't have to repeat that. Um, our world is going to be changed, there's no question about it. But it's going to be changed in a major, major way. And I think it's going to affect our quality of life. It's going to affect our property values. And if that's indeed the case, that's going to reverberate back to the city and the city budgets. Because we're getting a lot of taxes from a lot of houses on Round Hill Road at the moment. So what I'd like to do is also say, please, please realize that this is not just the renovation of a church or the remodeling of a garage or the, um, the redevelopment of a school for residential. This is an 11 acre parcel. It's a huge project. It's going to change and alter the character of the city. We are all dependent on your care, which I know you will give to this project when you think about it, when you vote on it, and please do consider those of us who are also sharing in this, who are sitting on Round Hill Road and in the neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. I'm George Snowden within Bancroft Road. I'm probably the longest uh, resident. I, I moved there in 58. I've been there ever since. <clears throat> in the interest of brevity, let me say I agree completely with the two previous uh, speakers. And in particular, what happens if the Opal thing doesn't go through? Thank you. Oh, hold on, hold on. Yep, sir. Just a, a little footnote. Can you come? Charles Robertson, 33 Langworthy Road. Just a footnote to what's been said about traffic. I'm delighted with the idea that there would be bicycle racks up there. How many people from Opal have bicycled up? <laughs> I speak to someone who bicycled for 75 years. There won't be a lot of bicycle traffic. Yeah, that, that's a point I also wanted to make that I forgot. That you could put five bike racks. You could paint it. Sir, 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 it's sir, it's not. Thank you. Anybody who hasn't spoken yet? This is a very quick comment. It's not as if uh, suddenly all the traffic is going to go on the lower Bancroft. There is already traffic on Bancroft. And with the congestion that's going to occur on Round Hill Road and at those intersections, more and more people are going to use Bancroft. I'll grant you it won't be as much uh, as it will be if a back exit is created, but it's but the problem exists now or will exist. Sir, in the back. Raphael Adler, I'm on Hillside Road, and thanks for hearing me. It seems clear that the traffic situation is such, well, let me put it this way. If the project goes through, the neighborhood will be radically transformed. Uh, and uh, the traffic situation, my sense is that if more access roads are built, they'll be used. Uh, I guess, sorry, I, I guess I would suggest that that we think about other paradigms. What I find sort of disturbing about the situation is we're trying to apply paradigms from systems that don't really work to a current situation. Think ahead 25 years. Think about what the infrastructure will look like. Think about how many cars will be on the road. I understand that we have to think about six months from now and 
12 months from now. But we're also talking about projects that will last for generations after we go. And it seems to me that we it might be more productive to think long term as well and to factor that into some kind of solution. I wish I could speak more specifically. I don't have any expertise in this area. But, but it seems to me that the current situation calls for perhaps more creative thinking than to apply older paradigms. Again, I wish I could be more productive. Anyone else who hasn't spoken? No? Yes, Miss? Uh, just a footnote to what I was saying about the traffic and the commercial. Um, as I said, I didn't want to repeat what had been said before. Uh, one thing that uh, no one seemed to comment about was the fact that if there is indeed the daycare center up there, the daycare center actually has people coming and going four times a day. And I can attest to that because I lived next to one for actually the same one for probably 30 years. So I can tell you that there is intense traffic four times a day, not just two times a day. So that's another thing to consider in all of this. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Questions from the board? Comments? It's almost 10 of 11. Do you want to? Do we have enough to I'm really close, close or do you want to keep it open while we? Um, well, I had some more questions. Okay. So. I, you know, I, or did you have anything you want? Well, some of the stuff is is based on what uh, the comments were. Um, one of the one of the uh, comments is about fencing, and as far as I can see, you're not planning on fencing off, putting up borders, no trespassing signs. There's there's yeah. uh, no, none whatsoever. Uh, the walkability is uh, highly desirable, so that will stay. Playground will be modified because the existing playground doesn't meet child safety regulations. But we want it to be an open campus that's used by all the neighbors. So, then could the tennis courts? Excuse me. Will the tennis courts be staying? Yeah, they'll be there, and they'll be open to the public. Yeah, uh, we we're not going to police them. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, well, one of the that fact is one of the problems and a lot of great comments and a lot of things we've taken into consideration, some things we just can't, can't accommodate, can't answer. Um, but I, I think the comments were all very articulate. Um, Bancroft Road exit down there, that slope is not 5%, it's 45%. Uh, we did look not at that so. potential. Not so. um, and we had it graded and measured where we would have to if we applied standards for creating the road. The road that's there is not, would not meet any, any present guidelines or standards. So where we would have to exit and where we would have to come down would, would create that 45 degree slope. So it makes little sense. The other problem is that water will always be a problem. Prior to even the Clark School, prior to its predecessor, this was a resort because of hot springs that still exist on the site. It is inundated with water um, and it, it, it mineral springs, excuse me. Uh, I wish there were hot springs. Um, so you have a lot of water penetration. You've got some, some natural um, uh, geyser types of locations that come up. The other thing with the Bancroft drop, that's where um, the existing drainage line exists. Um, so tearing through there um, is, is quite a project. But I, I do agree that um, you know, the trees, if there are trees that are impeding our Bancroft Road, they need to be taken care of. Uh, as part of the traffic mitigation, um, additional uh, blocks on that side, I mean, we're open to all of those. Well, the okay. fact that you've l looked at Bancroft says that you would actually, I mean, it would, it would improve your site if you could work that out. But the point is that you've looked at it and it wouldn't work. It's a bear. Um, and I think that if you want to talk an iced up road, I think that that thing would be a sheet of ice in the winter. Um, Just to talk about the great difference. <clears throat> From the side of the engine, from the side of the boiler house, there's got to be a 10 foot drop before you can get in the back door. You got to go down a set of stairs to a landing, go down a set of stairs to a landing. You open up a set of doors in the boiler house and you go down a set of stairs. So you're already down 
six feet to get to a somewhat level area. That's the 45 degree area that he's talking about. So you gotta take it from there to a point. So you're talking about building everything back up, which now creates outflows and adverse areas as well. I, I was just making the point that I was pleased that you had considered it and they were given it to talk. Yeah, we thought, listen, if we could have had a, a secondary means of uh, egress and entrance, uh, we obviously looked at that and a couple other possibilities. It just, it was not, it was not. And, you know, I, I think there are great comments about the, the turn. I mean, I've, I've made that turn lots of times on a weekly basis. And the left-hand turn is difficult, but uh, with all due respect, I think that's an issue for, uh, I think it will always be difficult as it is now or in the future. I think it should be a right-hand turn only. I mean, I think that the, it's a traffic pattern issue that can be resolved, um, you know, that has nothing to do with ours and the development. I mean, it, you know, you've got a walk, a crosswalk right there as you take a left-hand turn, and in any, I don't care if there were five houses on the street, anybody going down that street taking a left-hand turn is going to have a tough time, yeah, especially when it's slippery the in the crosswalk water. Crosswalk blocking the traffic is about the only way we get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, while you're there, because the other question I had is um, along the lines of the tennis courts, the, the gymnasium, I think you guys have said, you know, you're not turning it into a club. No. Just historically, uh, the rec department has used it um, for the basketball courts. The, the pool has been open to the public. Are there any plans, or have you guys worked out an agreement with the rec department to continue to use that gym and the, and the pool? I, I mean, we're, we're completely open. Uh, we have uh, our only idea at this point was just to, to add some Nautilus equipment and, and put a passcode, a, um, a key fob on it so that uh, residents had access to it. If uh, anybody from the neighborhood wanted to participate in it, uh, you know, have a service fee of $10 a month or something just to make sure that we keep up with maintenance. But the building is in exceptional condition. And there is not a single plan, and there won't be, to, to touch it in any way. Well, I guess what I, what I, I'm not sure if we want to make it a conditioner or, or uh, to allow the rec department to continue to use the, the Do they still use it? As, or is as, it? I, as I understood it um, from talking with Lou, the building inspector, and with planning and zoning, if that building does become public, then you have to add it into the mix. You have to add the parking. You have to add the traffic counts. You have to add that because now it's a rather than accessory to the the uses that are already there. Mm -hmm. You're making it a public entity. Now you got to account for parking, traffic, and et cetera. No, not here. That's what. That's why so we that, kept that yeah. as accessory. Yeah. We kept. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're the, you're the introducing. The wants to use it. I, you know. Well, I mean, it's we a good part when my kids. Guidelines, yeah, when my kids were in the rec department and played basketball there, I used to park in the lot. Behind Ross Hall, because right. <laughs> there's nobody any there. Right. There's never anybody there. So. Yeah, it's an it's um it's in pristine shape. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a great. It's so that's the so if they did if we did make it a condition that the rec department the had to use it, it would change the use. Oh yeah, you can, I don't think you could do that because you want to evaluate what that would be. I mean, that would add another element of functionality to the site, which you you know you could consider, but you'd want to probably see what that amounted to and I don't know if the rec department wants it or I don't know yeah I don't know if they still use it this was a couple of years ago when they were using it for for basketball and the yeah. as far as we're concerned it's an amenity to the to the to the residents in the neighborhood right and again if uh, this repeats the question I said before if that if the if the use of that building changes it would have to come before us anyway right. mm -hmm. so um, can I ask another one sure you're on a roll I'm on a roll um, one of the things I don't see on the site, and you know, we didn't talk about snow or dumpsters, but where are you going to be doing? I imagine now there's a central trash collection mechanism that takes care of all the buildings. Where on the site are dumpsters or trash collection? How's that? By that, um, a lot of that is over in the back work area by the boiler house. So what if cool? What are the, what are the, if there's a medical office in Coolidge, or if there's a, a lawyer's office? Yeah, in I, I know we're using the term medical. We're not big fans of medical office. Well, that's no, not, whatever. What, that's what not our highest and least best out, use. Though. What what what's going to happen? What are those? What are the facilities going to be for disposal of trash from? I mean, what, I am not that'll sure. be commercially removed off the premises. It's got to be stored somewhere until the the, the trucks arrive. Yeah, it? I think those dumpsters would be in that area. So there's just nothing on the plans. Like for right. Gouth, I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, is a pretty big building. I would imagine you're going to have a dumpster for that. Yeah. So yeah. There's, it should be there, yeah. I don't think it's not going to show on the sign, but 
That's what I mean. Usually, that right now. there's existing dumpsters in in most of the locations. Right. So typically, what's going to happen is we're going to say the dumpsters have to be screened. Yep. If I it's can't behind see. the building, then you're not going to be able to see it. Well, it depends which building we're talking about. I mean, Adams, you can see. Even if it's not on the plan, we would, as a commercial, we would screen those anyways. Right. We don't, we don't want those. Things. And then what are you going to do about snow removal? How are you going to handle the... the well, it would be taken off site. There's, there's a, a regular open space. That we, and, you know, are we talking about last year's snow or the year before? Yeah, what? <laughs> I don't think yeah. we could ever accommodate for the year before, but... Yeah, because uh, I imagine... I mean, there is a lot of space, but I imagine... It's there's a lot of open space on, on the campus for the snow removal. Yeah. Um, don't hold me to it if we have a year like the year before last. Well, that's... I mean... I guess it is a commercial place, you know, it's incumbent upon you guys because people have to park. Absolutely. To it's in so our best interest. It's incumbent upon you to get rid of the snow. So I think one of the changes of, of, of the use clearly brings along with it a much um, higher standard of, of maintenance and, and upkeep mm -hmm. to bring it to a commercial level. Right. And that includes snow removal on the street. I mean, we're not mandated to remove snow on the street, but <laughs> it's in our best interest to run our own plows up and down when we have to. And you guys aren't putting it. There's no light poles. There's no new light fixtures. <laughs> yeah. oh. okay. uh, one thing, we're still in the public comment. I should enter into a record. Of, there's a correspondence that we've been asked to uh, read from Deborah Eaton. And I think Tom, sure. uh, Tom yeah. uh, you spoke to it uh, before, but uh, Zeaton sent this in earlier, so I'll just, uh, it's a little bit lengthy, but I'll try to plow through it. To the City of Northampton Planning Board, I'm writing in regard to the proposed development of the Clark School campus by the Opal Development Group because I'm unable to attend tonight's meeting. As a close neighbor of the proposed project, I will be directly impacted by the decisions made by the Planning Board in regard to this project. I'm in favor of many aspects of the proposed plan, and I believe that developing the Clark campus for new uses is in the best interest of the city and the neighborhood. I'm glad that the look of the Clark buildings and campus and most of the trees will be preserved. I also support the efforts of the zoning and planning boards to find ways to encourage alternative means of transportation such as walking and biking in the city's neighborhoods. On the other hand, I'm very concerned about the amount of traffic which will be generated by this development. It seems to me that the only time to significantly affect the impact of this development is now before plans are finalized. In terms of the OPAL plan, I would encourage the board to include conditions which will further efforts to reduce or mitigate vehicular traffic. Some of those conditions have been suggested by the city's traffic engineer, such as a covered bus waiting area westbound on Elm Street and the use of speed bumps on Round Hill Road. More could be done by requiring that pedestrian walkways throughout through the campus be available to the public and by ensuring that bike paths and bike racks are incorporated into the site plan. There may be other creative ideas which could impact this aspect of the development, and I would encourage the board to support as many of those ideas as possible. My major concern about the proposed development is the increase in traffic on Round Hill Road. Therefore, I would ask the board to carefully review the information provided by the OPAL group to determine if traffic impacts have been accurately projected, keeping in mind that once a project is approved, the ability to decrease the impact will have been lost. I would also ask the board to carefully consider the question of what amount of traffic increase can be accommodated without dramatically changing the character of this lovely residential neighborhood, which contributes to the character of the city. Rather than simply apply percentages to the types of uses, i.e. 20% high traffic commercial development, I would suggest that the types of uses allowed should be driven by a maximum traffic allowance. In other words, the board could stipulate that the traffic increase could not exceed a specified acceptable amount, and the developer could then plan the percentage of various uses accordingly. Finally, last paragraph, finally, I have seen several traffic studies provided by the developer, and I think an increase of nearly 800 vehicle trips per day or more is an unreasonable burden to put on one street in a fairly quiet residential area. If the consensus is to create denser neighborhoods and the result is that there are more cars in traffic, I would respectfully request that the traffic be distributed to other parts of the neighborhood by creating additional egresses from the parking areas on the Clark campus. Although there are some questionable engineering challenges, I believe egresses on both Bancroft and Henshaw are quite feasible. A single egress on each side of Round Hill Road means that the entire impact of the traffic increase is borne by one street. I'd like to see the board at least request and consider a plan with those additional egresses before granting approval. Sincerely, Deborah G. Eaton. So. Sure, can I just yep. address that? Yeah. Uh, I think the 
address a couple of things. Yep. Uh, the, the subject of report, traffic report revisions has come up several times. Our initial traffic report was based on the leasable, projected leasable areas, but per the zoning ordinance, it is required that it's submitted based on gross areas. And again, that really inflates the numbers a lot. And also, this the whole 20 percent. Again, we were those numbers are broken out in order to allow you know, flexibility going forward. This phase leasing and phase renovations here, but again, they're they're inflated numbers. So the traffic report, all the people throwing around the numbers. I'm not saying it's not an increase, but they are inflated, and it's it's by virtue of the zoning ordinance and having to go by the gross numbers. Um, and again, we have 180 total spaces on site. So as people are thinking about the amount of traffic on site, I'd ask them, you know, instead of looking at you know, thousands, of which at these conservative number, think about 180 parking spaces. And they're about half office and about half residential. Just, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, how many trips do you expect? And, and just to just try to put, put it more realistic, because really it's, this, it's an atypical type of project, like I keep repeating, so this historic renovation project. And so these numbers get inflated because of the zoning ordinance. And just to kind of bring it back to reality, just 180 parking spaces. Um, and, you know, very valid concerns people are bringing up. I, I think they're important to note. Uh, and again, the applicant, Opal's, agreed on a mitigation uh, package or a mitigation fee to be implemented in the areas of concern in the neighborhood. And, and certainly, I think there's been a lot of focus, very valuable focus from the, from the neighbors on certain areas. And, you know, that can be a consideration as, you know, we work with the city would apply the, the mitigation fees. So, it, you know, we're willing to work with the city and, you know, again, that input is very valuable. So just wanted to address some of the points. Thank you. I just want to follow yeah. up on the traffic. Um, there were some comments about whether well, there's some other peak times for different uses, but um, the important thing is looking at where generally throughout the city peak traffics are a problem and what we have to mitigate for. Um, and those hours are taken into consideration, all the uses that are um, typical at that hour. So it's mostly workforce uses, but um, even, you know, school dismissal is included in overall, the overall evaluation of where the peaks are. And school dis dismissals don't increase, create a peak at a different time. So it's sort of wrapped into the, um, the general analysis for traffic studies. And then, and so um, in Northampton, the peak, afternoon peaks have really um, overall in the system are the ones that are most important to mitigate for. So that's why we asked, and that's what the standard is, is looking at the afternoon peak trips from 4 to 6 p.m. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned that the grade on Bancroft is 40, or that road that could potentially be better, is 45 degrees. Just out of curiosity, what's the grade on Round Hill going into Prospect Street? Excuse me, I just want to comment. My name is Dan Batch. I, was, I gave Demetrius that information. I was referring to from where I believe this gentleman was talking about the side of the boiler house. No, I wasn't give, I wasn't talking about the side of the boiler house. But I get what you're saying. So the side of the boiler house and the engineer's house. There's what's the general grade on Round Hill? Because my understanding is you know, anything's possible, it's just a money issue. Mm -hmm. So I, I would I would guess 28 to 30 percent. Towards the bottom. Yeah. But you have to have, and that's not a bad thing. Even 45 is doable. It's how much distance you have to go. And there's a big difference of looking up the hill than looking down the hill. So when we have to generate a road going downhill, we start, you can't start at the, at, at the high end of the peak. And the only place that you could enter a road there, because you can't take down the other buildings, is next to the boiler house. You can't start road anywhere else. Well, you can change the grade, but I just want to point out, it is, I believe, it's just a money issue, and I understand their position, and I'm, I'd be doing the same thing, but I believe the Henshaw situation and Bancroft is just money, and it does impact our quality of life and the traffic situation, so I, I do think it really should um, require further study. Because it's, it's a big, it could really make things a lot more pleasant for us up there. And I think it's worth, it's worth a little more information. Okay, could, hold on. Yep. I just want to speak, to, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I, I definitely can understand your point. It, it, there is a limit to what you can do with the grades. A common, I don't know what the Northampton requirement, but typically it's around 10% for maximum grade on a driveway. Um, 
And that, that is just like a narrow driveway. It's not a road right now. Well, I haven't seen the town it, say that it's not possible. Okay. I'm, uh, but, and also, as Dan's point, as you come to that landing behind the boiler room right here, and this is like 10 feet below here, so it's not, this is already, as you see these contours, very tight. You come up here, you still got to make up another 10 feet or so to get to the roadway elevations. Yeah. So I, it's, I, it is I guess, I, I mean, the, the, it's maybe design, it, it's it, it certainly can be done. It's money. My address, I, I'll respond to you directly. It's not about the money. Okay. It is more preferable for us to have that road. It adds value to what we're doing. If we had a second mean of egress, the project would be much more valuable and desirable. So we would want to have that. But as we look at that and we have our engineers look at it, 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 it is, as a task, it's very difficult. And what becomes real difficult after the fact is we have to do and get it in. It's, it, that road is, is a major drainage point for the entire campus. You know? that direction from that left side of the campus, that thing is going to be ice and it's going to dump a, a whole lot of water. You're now going to have a funnel going to Bancroft in one spot, dumping all that water onto Bancroft and down. Like we have on prospects right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that doesn't make the problem. problem. It doesn't make the problem. Well, it's 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 another, guys, if we could bring it back here. Mr. Green, one last comment, please. Okay. Uh, let me use this map. Uh, the 45% grade is over here in the powerhouse. What I'm talking about, if everybody can see it, you see the maintenance garage and the engineer's house. There's approximately 45 yards, a little over, between that and the road. I happened to go by there one day when there was a guy there with a 100 foot, uh, 100 uh, yard measuring tape. Uh, it's about a 5% grade. It's a very, it's a very uh, gentle grade. Uh, you there may be drainage problems. I don't know about that. What I suggest is simply that the city send an engineer to look at it. If you'll call me, I'll be glad to walk through uh, with <laughs> it. Not, it's nothing like it. It's not even an 11. As a matter of fact, the guy who was there was surveying for uh, coal ash residue, and he pointed out where there was a 12% grade, and, and, it, and, it, and it wasn't in that area. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. Question about the, uh, the water falling off on the Virginia Hook on the other side. Is there still storm water required for this to be used? Right, so there's not an acre of disturbance. Anything that would be an acre more of disturbance would trigger a separate stormwater permit. And since they're, um, they've really not sort of narrowed the, um, the scope of the project to a certain extent, is, it doesn't trigger that. And so there are historic flows in a lot of places. In, I mean, it's been mentioned this is a hill, so the drainage is not going to be altered from its historic mm -hmm. condition. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, um, could you just name historic or well, the proposal in front of the board is what it is, and anything, any change from that would be, would require additional review, but given that the, the zoning allows a mix of uses, actually, urban residential C district in which this lies also allows mixed use, office and residential. Um, there's greater leeway with this 20% medical type or high retail type office use and the, the um, allowance for that is to make the development more um, and preservation more feasible so the city gains and the, and the community gains preservation of the site. I don't think you could, and that's a permanent historic restriction, so you can't go back on that. So once this is approved and granted, it has to remain. The uses within could change, but the the site could not change. Okay, it's ten after eleven. Um, public comments still open. We can continue the hearing, think about it, and go at it again next time around. We can close public comment and try to hammer through something, or or close pub. Well, I guess those are the two options. Either either we stay and figure it out or we continue this uh, for another time when 
it's you guys early in the night. close the hearing and continue just right. the conversation. Well, we could approve it. All of the above. Any preference? I mean, if you guys are up for it, what time is it? And after 11. Like I said, we can, we, can, we can close public hearing if you're comfortable with that and discuss. And if our discussions don't get, go anywhere, we can continue it from there. You might want to go over DPW comments before closing the public hearing. Okay. Okay, let's hear the DPW yeah. comment. <clears throat> Um, initial plan showed um, oh, no, that's been addressed. Sorry, um, the granite curb. Uh, the proposed granite curb is adjacent to existing concrete sidewalk. It's unclear how a new granite curb can be installed with adequate compaction without disturbing the sidewalk. Applicant is required to replace in kind any sidewalk panels that are damaged with it, installing the curb. In addition, up to one year after installation, the applicant will replace any concrete sidewalk panels that crack or break within 18 inches of the new granite curb. Um, cracking will be assumed to be the result of improper compaction under the walk during curb installation. Um, it's unclear if the four existing concrete walks that meet Round Hill Road along the western edge are handicap accessible. If they're not, these access points should be made handicap accessible when the curb is being installed. Installation of handicap access ramps should be considered on the east side of the existing crosswalks. Existing crosswalk striping disturbed by curb installation so shall be restored. Um, and then in terms of traffic, um, um, there's comments about just sort of emphasizing the traffic mitigation letter that you all saw and then went to um, DPW. It's also on the website about mitigation measures that have been discussed. I do want to add to that. There's been a discussion about raised intersections and speed humps. And in this situation, raised inter raised um, intersections or raised crosswalks are different and require different drainage um, um, analysis. So there hasn't ever been a recommendation for raised crosswalks per se because that means it's going curb to curb. And then I think you also heard one of, um, I think in the letter mentioned there's a concern about bicyclists and um, having to go up and over these bumps. But speed on humps, the difference is they don't go all the way curb to curb. So that would allow drainage and it could allow cyclists to go on either side. So I just want to clarify that. Um, uh, Round Hill Road is narrow and eliminating on-street parking along Round Hill was proposed as a possible way to improve traffic flow and ensure emergency vehicle access. If this mitigation is pursued, it will be through the established channels of recommendation of Parking Transportation Commission um, and a change in the parking ordinance. Um, The DPW letter also indicates that the office tenants will not be permitted to park on the easterly side of Round Hill Road where it's currently permitted. Um, moving on to um, then um, a reiteration of some of the ideas about mitigation, which then could be worked through in more technical detail uh, staff. For sewage, excuse me, sewage use, the information shown in the plans for the existing drainage system is not complete. Prior to developing the site for new uses, the applicant will be required to verify with the appropriate investigations that the existing roof leaders and surface stormwater system are connected to the municipal drainage system and not to the municipal sanitary sewer system. If the stormwater and sanitary sewer systems are found to be interconnected on the site, the owner will be required to separate the systems per approval by a DPW. Um, and then in terms of the detail sheets, details are not numbered and are not easily located on the plans. Please number the details and cross-reference. Um, so I, I'm not sure other than, um, let's see, it's not clear whether where DPW standard crosswalks and signage is proposed to be installed. And I think that relates to the details. So um, I think in my staff memo to you all, I also had mentioned that um, the crosswalk standards that the city uses and requires should be used um, to reconfigure the existing crosswalks up there. But there's some comments from people as well about doing that. 
particularly when the new curb is installed and those configurations have to be um, redrawn. Does any of this preclude our approving it tonight? No. And have you seen I think you this could condition um, any of these. There's also the, the there's a couple other conditions, Carolyn, that, that were in the staff report. In staff, yeah. Yeah. Um, inside or sheltered bike storage for both residential and commercial buildings should be provided, particularly given the amount of excess unleasable areas within the buildings. Yeah, I mean, I think well, I, I think there's a question raised that there are five locations for bike racks, but it's not clear how many how much storage capacity that allows. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a, a point that you might want to clarify with the applicant about how much storage is there and what kind of shelter is there for that storage. Well, in the sense, in, in the, the both the size of the bike racks, and you know, for example, on Village Hill, where we, I, we required at least some of them to be covered. I think, right. Uh, right. There are a couple of the bike racks that are covered in Village Hill. Um, well, that's the applicant. As long as they're not visible from the street. I can't see. Oh, sorry. As long as they're not visible from the street, they're still considered a new structure. So with the historic, they can't be visible from the street. If they're covered or if they're just there? If they're covered. So if a bike rack can be anywhere, but if it's covered, that's where you hit their... Yeah, when it's covered, it can be interpreted as another structure that impedes the eye line. And in turn... Right, right. right of sight, thank you. So as long as it's behind the building and not viewable from the street, shouldn't be a problem. What if it's internal to the building in those wide hallways? Uh, yeah. As a historic preservationist, I, I would have a heart attack if somebody put a bike rack in one of those 110-year-old hallways. So it would have to be in the cellar. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's... I don't think that really matters so much. I think that... Yeah, I think what we're just looking for is internal storage in some of those buildings. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, you have like bunker concrete brick cellar, so that's right. That's fine. Yeah. Um, there was. We can talk about the traffic mitigation, I guess. Um, Mr. Chairman, can I just a couple of quick comments on what the DPW comments? Were? Yeah. Um, the crosswalks. We included the details. We also included a note about you know the locations were to be determined. Again, we had ongoing coordination with planning and the, and the DPW about what would be the offsite mitigation and where the crosswalks and what type of crosswalks. We didn't feel comfortable putting a this is where it's going to be. Here's where it's going to go. So we put a general note referring to that. So we did try to address it. And also the drain lines. You know we those were investigated. You know there's, there's only so much you can do from uh, above grade. And uh, you know also the records from Clark were reviewed. And they were connected as best they could on the plan. So there was diligence done for them. It wasn't like something we just ignored. I just wanted to make okay. that point. Okay. Yeah, and I think just to follow up on that, DPW is thinking smoke test or dye test or something right. to make that final determination. Yeah. Were there any other staff comments which we haven't hit on? Uh, that was it from DPW. There was. Um, just one other thing, and I, before you know, I'd like to get the the applicant's thoughts on um, the whole idea. Where we talked about is eliminating, or the applicant is going to petition to the city that um, we remove parking on Round Hill Road. Mm -hmm. Either on, I don't think you can park on both sides. I think it's only one right. side. And it's only for sections. There, the entire street the entire, is right, right. And in, in fact, one of the the abutters even question that as, as to the wisdom because what happens when they have overflow and they want to park on the street? Right. But somebody did mention. Um, is there going to be the ability for people to use on a on some kind of basis to to make an agreement with Opal that they could do guest parking? You know, if somebody's having a, a party and they want to see, can they contact Opal and say, "Can I park ten cars on your your lot?" Or is there going to be that ability for something like that? Mm -hmm. um, that. Uh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we are maintaining the dining dining common which is a commercial kitchen um, in, in um, Galbraith. Did I get it wrong, though? Gaywith. Gaywith. 
um, uh, along with the 280 seat uh, dining room and meeting rooms on the first level. And we're leaving the open area on the outside. As a matter of fact, I, I believe we're hosting the 150th anniversary of the school there. But that'll be available for people to rent out and to use. And, you know, we're not, if there's not parking there, like I said, I mean, we're going to, we're not going to police them until we have to police. Right. Until there are, there's, uh, there are complaints that, let's say, Smith College students are going up the hill and parking and taking away parking spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing is the city council could make any determination saying, you know, no on street parking between, you know, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. or right. something. Right. And then after hours. No. And weekends. Yeah, right. and on weekends, then right. it would be available. So that could be easily part of the city council ordinance. Well, just from sitting on TPC, there's never a full unanimous idea about changing the street from anything to anything. So, and they hate I mean, to put up signs, too. Okay. Do we have enough to close uh, public comment? I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we... To extend it, we, we, if there's strong feeling, we get the same opinions, we'd make everybody come out again for a long night. I think we've heard it. Brandy, John, you guys good? Can I get a motion? And we would close public comment. comment. Second. All in favor? Okay. okay. Two things to vote on, right? Yeah, site plan and special permit. Well, the and the historic. Are we voting on that? Well, no. By approving the plan, the zoning requires that a historic preservation restriction be reported. So, as one of the conditions that um, is in my recommendation for you all to consider is that you know the reporting hap <coughs> excuse me happens um, you know prior to request for a building permit that the that it's in place, and that's to comply with the zoning. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, if the Clark School had a change in their business plan and had a rejuvenation of activity on their campus, mm -hmm. would they have to come and ask anybody's permission to generate additional traffic or any of these things? Um, so do you mean if, um, the if they all of a sudden had 100 students or cars a day and buses and, you know, they... In the at Bell Hall. At no, at on the campus. Assuming I mean. that Opal wasn't taking over the site. That yeah. Opal oh, 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 oh. just decided oh, to reopen. Yeah. 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 No, no. It's a um, the the only thing that would trigger another review would be if new construction were to be proposed on the site, or um, uh, a new use that wasn't a school use. So no, they could tomorrow decide that they change their business model and start up again and wouldn't have any there would be no reason. but did I don't know if they if, did someone have to come for all these buildings that have been sold in the past and converted in from yes mm -hmm. so each of those had to come each of yeah. those came in for oh, site yeah. plan okay. been dealing with this for years right. yeah. and I think that's why we're dealing with this now because all the buildings that that lent themselves to being converted right. to right. condos have been converted and right. we're left with this array of buildings, and it would seem, from a planning sense, that it would be best managed if it was by one one developer instead of each build. We're looking at something essentially nothing is is physically happening to the site, which is what we would want from a historic preservation sense. And ev in almost every instance, if not in every instance, everybody prefaced their comments about quality of life and traffic concerns with I love the plan, keeping the buildings, keeping the green space and so forth, but, and then we talked about quality of life and, and traffic. So like a, a lot of things we talk about, it ends up to be a discussion about traffic. <laughs> well, but I mean, the, the thought here is the worry of what would happen to 10 acres in the middle of town. I mean, you, you can, you can keep people from tearing down a building for a year. I mean, that's, that's just right. basically what we can do. So those buildings could go away, and we could have 
an entirely new problem facing us, you know, as far as what would happen up there. So even though I'm frustrated with parking and transportation and and, and fool more venues than this, I I view this as a as a the kind of solution for the property that we had hoped to find. And I think that was the reason we zoned it so that it would right. it would be just that tipping point so that you would have uh, an interest in in keeping those kind of buildings the same for three big churches in town right. and, uh, you know a lot of properties in town that we hope are going to be kept and maintained as historic buildings that that was a, entirely the intent of those zoning changes and so in this case it's actually working to do just that I mean I I hesitate to think what could go into 10 acres in the middle of town right I mean there there had been discussions previously that before you know, Opal came on board that yeah. maybe in Clark's interest, they would start doing sort of individual demolition based on what their own feasibility said about what was reusable. And there, again, the only thing is the um, demolition review and demolition delay. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there was, there would be nothing otherwise that would prevent a property owner from doing that on their own. Well, we've seen it. I mean, when Smith put in the science building. I mean, Smith right. was able to knock down, I don't know how many houses was before my time on the planning board, but you know that was a very controversial dozen. <laughs> it was a very controversial project because, yeah, they, they basically took down a bunch of houses. And, and so, yeah, somebody could have bought this land and leveled the entire 11 acres and built, what, 200 units? I don't know how many you built on right. 11 acres. You can build a lot. Um, and I was up there walking on Sunday, and it's a very pretty open space. And it's just a great spot, you know. Well, with the I, bit, we, we, with I the like market. the mixed use. If we, if, you know, what what you would hope that that does is is live work situation. Right, and we're we're trying to project in some instances what's going to happen 10, 20 years down the line. You would hope, to a certain extent, people are living and working in that area. Well. Um, what I could hope from this is that we know what the buildings are going to look like. I right. mean, that's that's the beauty of this one. If you are for the for the only certainty that we've got, looking ahead for decades and saying that's what this hill will look like. Right. right. Now, the historic restriction, Carolyn, that they're going to apply for, that we're making a condition that they apply for. Would that? I think somebody asked the question. It, it doesn't rule out being able to build a new building up there. It rules out doing anything to the buildings that are currently there. Is it? The local ordinance, so there's two things. Um, they're applying separately for tax credit status for historic preservation. Mm -hmm. So there are a whole set of rules. That, That's a federal or state? Um, well, it's, it's state, but it's with federal. I mean, you have to c comply with federal standards, essentially. Um, so that's a whole set of other rules that are um, above and beyond what the local ordinance says. The local ordinance says you have to preserve the buildings um, that uh, the his historic elements of the building, this are the defining features. You can't demo anything that would impact the building. It doesn't say anything, um, it doesn't look at it as a campus because the zoning envisioned buildings coming forward because there aren't a lot of, I mean, the church does have some campuses um, essentially around that have similar. Um, um, characteristics but um, so the zoning is a different thing but the zoning says you have to permanently preserve the buildings and so um, I suppose someone could come back and request um, a new building within the site um, but I that may be con inconsistent with the tax credit um, it sounds like it is uh, so then that's sort of off the table so we pretty much know what this site's going to look like yeah. for a long time, right? Yeah. Well, and the two, the buildings that they're getting the tax credit for are the ones that are associated with the only big open space that I see on the on the campus. Mm -hmm. So it's on the west side, possibly, but it's not. And so just to sort of review about traffic, um, it. There is there is a whole municipal process for going before the Transportation Parking Commission and asking for a change in the statute that 
controls the movement on the street or gets rid of the parking. And, right. and so I think that that process should be the way this is handled so that there is the, the full, you know, airing of it. Um, it. It seems unlikely that you're going to have that level of traffic without two full lanes of movement and 20 feet wide is as narrow as it can be to get two full lanes of movement. We're fixing to restripe parts of South Street to 10 feet a lane. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's a, that's a two-way road. Um, I know the potholes are frustrating. They're all over town. But right. That will also keep people from speeding. I mean, it's a perverse speed, <laughs> speed control, but it, it works. Well, what about the, I mean, Carol, do we, there's the $103,000 in traffic mitigation money. What's the process or when does that start as to how and where that money's gonna be spent? Well, actually, so there's a couple of ways that um, this can be um, allocated or used. And applicants can opt to just pay into a pot and then the city figures it out and has to, you know, deal with it. But um, I think I would certainly recommend that instead of having the money given, since there's going to they're going to be working in the street um, anyway, to go ahead and have the value of what could potentially be made in lieu to be actual projects. So we, it <coughs> comes right away. It doesn't sit in a pot for a while for it to get um, you know, sorted out. So my recommendation would be that you know prior to issuance of building permit. Um, <clears throat> well, prior to issuance of any site work, occupancy of a building, or within six months of issuance of a permit, you know, whichever one of those comes first, that the, um, for the residential units, half of that mitigation amount, 103000 offered by the applicant, um, be put towards improvements for pedestrian safety, um, and that the other half come prior to issuance of building permits for the commercial units so that you don't you, you're doing it along and consistent with the impacts that are going to be right. created um, and that the mitigation um, be determined by um, you know in the detail of those mitigations be hammered out with OPD and Department of Public Works um, to decide you know exactly where it goes and what it is and then, so then we would track how much money they've spent, and um, however far that goes, well, you would get the improvements done. Is everything still on the table? Speed humps? Yeah. Uh, there's yeah, there's nothing, lights. there's nothing yeah. firm. We have to look at, I mean, I think there were a couple um, really good suggestions by Department of Public Works about, um, you know, traffic calming on um, Round Hill and sort of the whole issue about um, where those might go. So those need to be determined. And then pedestrian crossing signs are lacking on both Prospect and Elm Street, so those um, may make sense. DPW is starting to really like the high-tech versions of signage, so it may be that you know we'll get less, we'll get fewer high-tech signs than we will um, standard signs. So I think it's a balance of sort of figuring out: do we want to spread out um, ped safety improvements longer along Elm and Prospect, right. or do we want to have some you know, big impact signage. Public comment so, uh, is over, so if you're going to say something, we, that's closed, so. Okay. Um, you know, this discussion, the, the egress on both ends of Round Hill are bad. They've always been bad. You know, in the winter, coming down Prospect, you just avoid because, as many people said, you end up, or coming down Round Hill, you end up in the middle of Prospect before you know it. So um, certainly there's going to be increased traffic, but it's, it's, it, it's an existing intersection that's that bad to begin with. It's not going to make a good intersection bad. It's going to make a bad intersection worse, and people will avoid it, I think, just like they avoid it now. Um, and coming off of Round Hill and taking a left onto Elm, it's it's a horrible juncture right there with the with across the road to to go into Smith and the crosswalk and there's a lot of things happening there now um, that don't make that uh, left hand turn desirable but I think what's in front of us now um, is more desirable uh, or is is 
it's better to know what this campus is going to look like 25 years from now and what's going to be happening there. And if there's an issue with a left-hand turn coming on a, onto Elm Street, that's fixable in the future if needed. I think people also will choose the path of least resistance. So Absolutely. they'll find other ways Absolutely. for the neighborhood. That's why we like grid streets instead right. of, you know, one way in and one way out. Well, and that's what convinces me that if the developer could have made the reasonable alternative access on the other streets, he would have. I mean, that's, it's just right. that that would be an incentive you would want to do that. Um, I, come, I make a left-hand turn out of Henshaw almost daily late in the afternoon. and. It, it's a problem. I mean, right. the alternative is you don't know where if you make it right turn only, you don't know how to get back downtown. Right. right. It's just you have to circle a block in a neighborhood somewhere else. Right. Any issues other than the um, conditions in the UPW or staff or clients that we have? Do we have to read the ones that are in the staff report? I think the, you, you so saw the summary um, except for one, I think. Aren't yeah, I think. You summarized uh, or read a couple, Stephen, and then Carolyn jumped in, and I don't know that there are many left. What was the last one? Oh, number eight. Um, I didn't hear um, what, did you want to make a condition about bike storage or how many bikes um, are available on site? So there's five bike racks? Yeah. What's a typical bike rack, eight? It depends well, on were, what the design there is. There was a question, I think, <laughs> one of the things, comments was that more detail was needed on on how big these what the storage capacity of these bike racks were. I mean, a bike rack could be one loop. That's right. Yeah, I think that's not that'll really hold more than one bike. One bike. I mean, and the existing bike rack on Gaway is one of the old timey a little uh, uh, yeah. milking stall ones. Well, you can pick up and move. In the bike rack design guide. In yeah. Yeah, bike rack design guide. Did specify the help? What's that? Let's, um, <laughs> let's put in a condition that they have to be filled. Um, but I think, so I think the issue is, though, it doesn't specify how many per square foot of office space. So I think, you know, maybe for the um, bigger office, you know, game. C6. C6. C6 shows the bike rack with trash can. And it's, uh, so that's the one that's next to Adam. Yeah, that's what they're showing in the plan. Right. The, the existing one on Gaway from the. Oh, right. So are we have to decide. So that's one, one of two, the old three, timing four, five, six, 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 That's probably fine. That's eight. I think that makes sense. I think, though, that you might want to require some account of the cellar storage in the in certainly right. I think we should the bigger the, buildings. Right, there should be the you know the residential and then the gay with. So at least eight internal then. If there's an eight, if the bike racks are eight at yeah. the building. It should be at least eight internal storage spaces or more. Yeah, not more. Eight. Yeah, I think that's minimum of eight. Yeah, I mean the other thing is if it's in a room, you don't know. The the what? Uh, if it's in a room, I'm not sure you need necessarily. Yeah, specify the number. I don't think. Yeah, right. specify the number. You can just say storage available. All right, so internal storage is available in the bike loops. We don't have to say anything because they're showing eight. Right. So, right. With a trash can. Right. Uh, there's a, a condition number eight from the staff about the trees. Right, so for all trees intended to be protected that are adjacent to proposed site work, a certified arbor shall submit to the Office of Planning Development a statement indicating that pros work will not affect the trees. Um, further, all protection measures recommended by the arbor shall be performed prior to any site work. And then the conditions from DPW about the um, sewer um, lines and then the, the curb and sidewalk. Anything that's damaged, basically, during construction for building right. and sale. There's an ongoing conversation with Smith about setting up a public bus stop on campus. And I'm wondering if this is the right time to get the covered bus stop on Elm down at the bottom of Round Hill. And, and is that, can that be part of the traffic mitigation designated work? 
I mean, I think it could be again. So there's a, there's a amount of allotted money. So I think we should look at that to see what do you where, you know does that make sense? Is it far enough along design wise, and does it make sense in that vicinity? Um, versus I, I don't know that I could decide right, you know, right. so route it, map and all sorts of things that you would right need. so I think we could do that at a staff level and figure out but I don't think it makes sense to stipulate now since we right. don't have all the answers. we'll try to do that with the PBTA and they they, they don't make stops where we put right. covered they, they stop right. that's the stop. other right. issue right. Right. so we don't run the bus no <laughs> just because there's a stop there doesn't mean they're gonna stop because um, they're PBTA <laughs> screening the dumpsters which seem to be an acceptable thing maybe that's a condition you want in yeah. there yeah is everybody in agreement that all dumps are looking to the screen you just make that it's not in the zone it's it's make that it. I know uh uh <laughs> you are okay. I think that's it for, for uh, conditions Yeah. We ready? Yeah. Pardon me wants to say one last thing about the traffic, but you know, for the last I don't know eight, ten years, as, as Clark School has been closing, I mean the traffic up there has gotten less and less. But historically, 15 years ago, buses, 100 staff, several hundred students, you know, and it, and it's it's it's. It's odd to have, you know, seen it now. You go up there now, it looks quiet and bucolic. It just looks like a park. But that's because there's nothing going on up there. It's a it's a it's an eleven acre parcel, a quarter of a mile from a very vibrant downtown that there's nothing happening in because the place has been closed. And so yes, any development up there is gonna add traffic. And as John was saying, if Clark decided to open that school up tomorrow and put in two hundred kids and hundred faculty, buses, and it'd food be like delivery, Northfield Mount Herman. It'd be like Northfield Mount Herman. <laughs> So it's 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 a, it's not quite the right comparison to say what it is today to what well, it's going to be when but, this project is but done. But even looking backwards, I mean, I, my worry is looking forward. That that something's going to happen on that on on that parcel of land located. It's too attractive a yeah. site. Yeah. So I, that's what you know. I'm I'm upset about the traffic, and I know the neighbors are, and 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 I'll hear a lot about it in other committees, but it's. It's a preferable use of the property compared to the alternatives right. if you don't. Right. You know? No, that's a really good point. I, I completely agree. That's a, I agree with you both. It's all three times you said it. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. It's awesome. Been, I'll stop saying it. Steve? All right. I'd like to. Uh, oh, this, well, so we got to do. Do we doing them both at the same time, Carolyn, or do you want to do one? You can do them both at the same time. I don't see the need to separate the votes. Well, one's a four vote and one's a five vote. Though. Right, but if right, so if okay. you think you need to separate, you can. Okay. <laughs> You're not required to. Uh, I move that we grant the request for site plan approval to convert historic education buildings to residential and mixed office use, and a special permit for reduction in parking for property at Clark School, Round Hill Road, Northampton, Map ID 31B-4 and 6, with the specified conditions. Second. No discussion. Did second. somebody? No, he. Oh, second. Yeah. Somebody's got a second. Sam, second. No, second. He can't. John, second. second. All in favor. Thank you. Um. We don't have to do the minutes necessarily, but I do need to do this letter of credit for Village Hill. You need to do letter of credit letter for Village Hill. Um, so, as you know, development has proceeded and roads have been constructed. They had a $3 million letter of credit. They want to reduce it down to, I don't know, they had one point, sorry. This is Hospital uh, Hill? The, Master yeah. yeah. They had 1.3 million. They want to drop it to 1.2.
and then extend the time frame. It was going to expire in November, so they want to extend the time frame till um, December 2016. And you guys just need to vote to approve the changes in the um, letter of credit. But I don't need Is to return anything. You go along with that. Yes, that's so plenty moved. of money. I move. Yeah. I made it. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. 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 It's not residential. It's called it feels like we do considered commercial. We and it's not high use. He did a good job uh, explaining them why you think it's a good project, despite the comments. So no, I just I wouldn't say that. It's. Well, I think it's they all know. under the umbrella of the 80 percent meetings on this day. Mm -hmm. It's not. Sure. It's not as someone. No, sure. they, I didn't think so. He's told them it's as good as. No, it's residential yeah. on one side. And on the other side, it's 80 percent standard commercial. That is a better word. And 20 percent high use commercial. The 20 percent change was to entice the development. So it's 100 percent commercial, right. but right. but 80 20 low That's use it. high use. We, do we adjourn? We got one more thing. No, we haven't. We adjourned. have minutes. Do you want to do that or do it next time? Thank you. For it's, um, it's almost tomorrow. You want to do minutes? What's a few more minutes? No. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had a correction on one. <laughs> oh man, maybe we should wait till next time. Yes, let's wait. I'm flat. You dead? You want to wait? Those was full of typos and it take forever to correct. Just I, I found one typo. Okay. We, can, we can approve all three if you correct the one typo. Okay, what, what's the day and the date? Hold on, hold on. Nope, I'm not voting. What? <laughs> oh, let's just save it for next time. All right, send me the typo. All right, correct. can I get a motion? All right. I'm going to we're supposed to get the minutes every meeting. No, we haven't done it. Yes, every meeting, we're three minutes. Well, it happens because of this, then we're Second. punching it to the right. next Second. episode. Second. Second. All right. All favor? All in favor? All in favor? All right. I voted. Good night, everybody.